Thanks everyone for joining us tonight for SingRay's webinar with our ambassador, Jennifer King. We're gonna be talking tonight about winter in Yellowstone, but first a little bit about Jennifer. She is an internationally acclaimed and award-winning landscape and wildlife photographer with a passion for teaching and inspiring photographers around the world. She draws on her fine art and design background to bring an artistic perspective to nature photography and has a knack for teaching composition and inspiring creativity. Jennifer is also the founder of Photography for the Fight Against Breast Cancer, an industry-wide organization bringing together the biggest names in photography to raise money for breast cancer research. You can find her photography, video tutorials, and interviews in Outdoor Photographer Magazine, Outdoor Photography Guide, Wild Planet, Camera in the Wild, Smoky Mountains, Journal of Photography, Via Magazine, Our State Magazine, and more. And Jennifer also speaks at many yearly photography summits and promotes continued photography education through books, tutorials, webinars, and educational videos. And we are so excited to have her here tonight. So Jennifer, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you. Welcome everybody. It's so good to have so many friends here getting together to share photography and getting excited about the future of travel and getting back out there to enjoy our cameras and all this wonderful stuff around us. Um, I'm going to talk to you about winter in Yellowstone. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen my Yellowstone photos. I talk about it quite a bit as it's one of my favorite places to photograph. And I'm really excited to be able to share um, my passion for winter Yellowstone with all of you. Um, let's get started here. You know, when I refer to winter in Yellowstone, I refer to it as the magical season. And this is because it's where quiet peacefulness of falling snow is met with some of the harshest conditions in our country. It's a place where the beauty of nature is challenged to thrive and of course to survive. Winter is a story of drama and from its wide variety of wildlife to its valleys from the forest to its unique geothermal features, winter in Yellowstone is a landscape truly filled with inspiration and drama for photographers. So today we are going to talk about the quiet season, the aesthetics of winter. We're gonna talk about how wildlife reacts to the harsh conditions and the photo opportunities that it makes for us. The colors of Yellowstone, photographing frost and steam, and of course, staying safe in freezing temperatures. Photographing Yellowstone during the winter is one of the best adventures any photographer can experience. I mean, winter is known as the quiet season. And this refers not only to the lack of traffic and visitors, but the environment of the park itself. The only way that you can access the inner circle is by snow coach or snowmobile. Um, and this provides an experience unlike any other season in the park. What this means for us as photographers is that we have the ability to photograph the landscape in peace and quiet. And when I'm in Yellowstone, the quiet allows for me to think artistically. And I find that my creativity really soars. I was not a person who was fond of winter <laughs> or cold weather by any means. I mean, I grew up in the Northeast, lived in Florida for a long time, kind of halfway in between now. But after my first trip to Yellowstone in winter, I found that there was so much beauty and drama during winter that I returned every year to photograph in the park. I mean, imagine walking 
in six inches of snow that has fallen overnight and it's fresh powder on the ground. You know, the ground is covered in a blanket of white. The trees are heavy with powder and the streams have frozen overnight and you are the first person to make a footprint in that snow. You have just stepped into a winter wonderland. It is amazing to experience especially because the true quiet and silence that you can actually hear the snow falling off of a tree and sometimes even on the ground when it's really quiet. I mean, we get used to so much noise in our world, right? Um, and the stark appearance and the lack of background chatter and cell phones and the hum of electricity, all of that stuff, just the world itself is a constant hum that we usually don't even notice anymore. So when the chatter is removed, you can really hear the stillness all around you. And it can be a little unnerving at first, really, as you realize how loud the world really is compared to this simple natural environment. We become accustomed to our surroundings and when they change, we feel the impact. The emotional effect can make you feel isolated, off balance, and even a little anxious at first. So John wants to know, did you have any special gear for your cameras, um, like extra batteries? What lenses did you use? Oh my gosh. I bring just about everything. Hi, John. I bring just about everything with me <laughs> to the park <laughs> because I think the opportunities are endless. Um, I take everything from a super wide, like 11 to 24, um, 16 to 35 millimeter, 24, 105, I usually take the one to 400. Sometimes I add in the 70 to 200. Um, I take all my filters, of course. Um, that requires, uh, Yellowstone has a lot of options. You're looking at wildlife and landscape photo opportunities. So you're going to want your graduated neutral density filters. There are streams and rivers. So having your ND filters, I like my very end duo filter for those because I can go from two to eight stops, but I've got everything I need to get a perfect shot. And then of course you need polarization, especially in the winter. When the sun starts to hit the snow, um, you really have to balance everything out with a polarizer. And for those of you that know me or have photographed with me before, I like to use a warming polarizer, though I do also have a neutral one. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to take, there's a lot to consider as far as gear and for clothing. And William wanted to know, do you take extra precautions to protect your equipment? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. You know, everything in winter becomes fragile. It does. And everything from the plastic on your lens cap or, you know, the, the dials on your camera, when something is below freezing, sometimes minus 10, 15, I think minus 15 was probably the coldest I experienced there, but I know it gets colder. Um, the simplest little bump into something can crack something and, and that's, that's always dangerous. I actually carry um, always in my bag, but especially extra in Yellowstone, I carry extra lens caps, lens covers, lens hoods. I put them all in my suitcase because it's quite often that I actually break something just because it's so fragile, um, those little elements. And yeah, so I take a lot of that. Of course, I take hand and foot warmers and a lot of gear that I can go into crazy if you want to know how to pack for winter. I'm a master packer <laughs> for winter. You know, winter is my favorite Yellowstone destination, but I truly spend nearly eight weeks photographing winter almost every year. Um, from Yellowstone to the Canadian Rockies to Norway and Iceland. So I've got quite a list of gear that gets me through the cold weather. And then someone asked if these trees have been through a forest fire or is that just what they look like in winter? Yeah, they do. They look like this in winter. They're actually petrified trees and they're along the area of the West Bank. When you get from the Madison River turnout all the way down to just about the old faithful area, you're going to see 
a lot of trees like this, and a lot of them are very close to the road, which is nice in wintertime because they're easily accessed. But when they get the snow on them, they're just really, really magical. I think you, you don't see all this stuff in the background necessarily. It's more simplistic, the environment. You've got steam and snow. And instead of seeing all the forest behind it, you really just see the trees, the blue sky, sometimes not blue sky, and it still looks really good. But there are a lot of these trees in that section of the park. And every section of the park has something different. You know, it, it could be this section with, with the petrified trees. It could be, um, it could be the forest. There's forests. There are valleys that have tons of wildlife that's easily spotted. And, and then you have rivers and lakes and everything. It's amazing to me how different it is. Um, and I've experienced it, of course, a lot in the summer before ever going in wintertime. But something about winter makes it really special. And like I said, I think it's a lot of that quietness that you don't get any other time of year. You know, it's like when you turn the world off to go to sleep at night, it seems quiet, but it's really not. You know, once you become accustomed to the silence, you begin to hear nature. And that's what's so wonderful about winter in Yellowstone because you've gone out there, you're somewhat secluded, the traffic is so minimal, though, you know, there are snow coaches and snowmobiles, but you can hear everything and the silence can really connect you to nature. And when you can connect to your subject and become in tune with it, you can begin to artistically translate its story. I mean, this emotional impact, once it's recognized, is a feeling that I know I want to return to all the time. It's energizing, it's rejuvenating. And I think that's what makes Yellowstone so incredible in the winter season. Now I came from a fine art and design background. So I've been able to explore and try different mediums over the course of, well, we'll just say a few years. <laughs> but about 10 years ago, I learned how to use a camera. So now photography is how I express myself and how I try to communicate the beauty of what I see and feel. But knowing how to find the artist within isn't an automatic switch, you know, even for a seasoned professional. And artists are always changing anyway, which is a good thing. But I think it is the barren scenery of winter that forced me to look at this landscape differently and ultimately changed me as an artist and a photographer. Um, you know, while there are lines and there, are, there is color and some really unique features to the park, it's often just bare of snow in lines like with these trees and some of the curves of the snow, you know, they're not as obvious and this forces me to think differently, to look for less obvious compositional tools. It's a blank canvas and I have to find the image I want to create. And this opens up so many possibilities, not only for when you're photographing in winter, but a style or a feeling that will translate into every other place that you photograph. Now, while I'm usually out in a snow coach before sunrise, when the first break of daylight appears and there's fresh fallen snow on the ground, there is anticipation and excitement. You know, have the bison awakened? Will the sun break through the clouds? We always want that to happen. Um, is the ground completely covered? You may be the very first person that day to put your footprint in the snow and perhaps next to a footprint of a wolf. You know, how refreshing a thought is that? The footprint in the snow is an incredible way to connect to the land you are photographing. And as photographers, it's not the drive to our shot location that entices us, right? I mean, it's the adventure. It's being a part of nature. That's what helps us connect to the landscape. Photographers, we don't just stand on the land. We are a part of the landscape. Well, that leads into some questions we have from the audience. Yeah. Too. Uh -huh. um, a couple of related ones. Do you use a guide? How long do you stay at a time? And do you camp or stay at a hotel? 
Well, okay, let's start with my camping days are done. I like the comfort of a hotel. <laughs> And I need electricity, right? So, uh, and winter is really cold. Um, it's not that I wouldn't camp in other places. So no, those are great questions. Now I like hotels and usually I will go and stay inside the park in the inner circle. And if you look at a map at Yellowstone, it has five different entrances from different corners of the states, but they all connect to a ring road basically that goes around the inside of the park. And that area, um, most of the park actually is only accessible by snow coach or snowmobile in the winter months. That was another um, question we had. Yeah, so there's only one road that's accessible to Yellowstone and that's from Gardner, Montana, all the way to Cook City, Montana. That's the Northern road. And that is open to traffic every day. So a lot of people come in with cars for day trips or they spend some time up there looking for wildlife. But what I find when I'm inside the park in the inner circle is that quiet that I'm talking about. So it allows me to a couple of things. One, to really get in tune with what I'm doing. And that's something that can't happen everywhere because a lot of places we go to are busy. Um, a lot of people, a lot of visitors, a lot of stuff going on, but there's not that many people in Yellowstone because only so many people can fit there. The Snow Lodge is where I prefer to stay. And the well, it's the only place to stay in the inner circle. Um, and they only have so many rooms. So it's very limited on who can stay there and how many nights and so forth that are available. But the day trips that you can do from there on a snow coach, um, and I would personally, I would take a private snow coach or when I have a group of people out there with me, you know, we're in a snow coach and we, and we go around together. But we can access areas of the park that you cannot access if you're staying in, say, West Yellowstone or Gardner, Montana. You may be able to take snow coaches from there, but that that's inner circle. I call that I guess just the inner circle. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. it, but it's where all the magic is. You know, you have the geothermal areas. You can get down by Yellowstone Lake. You can get down on the, you know, the east side of the park and come up through Hayden Valley. And you really have that area almost to yourself. So when I compare this to other locations that I photograph frequently, it's, it's much more isolated. And it's not just an isolation from, from the landscape, it's from the people. And it's from the, the numbers of people that can be at any given location photographing in all these great parks that we have. So it gives me a chance to really reach out to my inner self and focus on, on what I'm photographing. And there's so much drama in Yellowstone it's almost as if every corner around that circle has something different to offer. And yes, there are a lot of trees, there are a lot of geysers, but there's a lot of openness with, with a lot of nothing. So, you know, you have to think, what am I going to do creatively with my photographs in an area where there's not much but snow? And then you have the excitement of wildlife. That's always a big draw for not only myself, but you know, I think for a lot of people, they like to go to Lamar Valley and Hayden Valley specifically for wildlife because it's so easy to see. Guide. You use a guide to find or track the animals? No, I personally do not. I guide myself when I have a group. Um, I do hire a snow coach. I am not licensed to drive a snow coach. Um, you have to have a special license with that and they have to be an authorized vendor of the park or part of the uh, park service itself. They have people that do that. So I have to reserve a snow coach a long time in advance, usually a year or more in advance. And, and they, take, they take either myself around if I happen to be there by myself or, or a group around. And it's comfortable. It's nice. You know, they call them 13 passengers. They really don't hold 13 people, maybe 13 children. But uh, <laughs> you got to uh, give yourself a little room, especially when you have camera gear and everything else. And yeah. I always ask for them to put like a rack on the back, a big box, and that I can store some extra winter clothes in there, some lunch or food or blanket or whatever I might want later, even a tripod, because I usually carry a couple of tripods with me. Those are good questions. I, you know, I would always recommend a guide and, and not to go out to Yellowstone your very first time on your own. I, I would highly recommend that for safety reasons. Um, 
you know, there are a lot of dangers to Yellowstone. As beautiful as all that snow looks, it, it comes with some hazards and some dangers. Um, and to give you an example, I am experienced. And I know these things. I have proper gear and proper equipment. And goodness, last week I went there and I, I was going through Lamar Valley because Snow Lodge is closed, but I wanted to get out there anyway and just have a few days with some wildlife. And I had climbed down an embankment to get into a stream to photograph because there was a moose and I had, you know, he was off in the distance in a tree line, but I was going to give him time to come out. And I'd been in the stream a winter stream that was pretty close to frozen for about an hour. And then my boots started to take on water and I thought, okay, I waited another half an hour. The moose isn't coming out. I have to get up the hill and I have to change into boots. I take extra clothing, extra boots, everything, because that's a matter of life and death in some situations in winter. I couldn't get back up the hill. The hill had frozen and I was stuck down there. And this is someone I have experienced. Of course, I have a spot which is something I can, it's, it's a satellite for emergencies and I could push the button. I figured eventually someone would come by and <laughs> thank goodness, like uh, after about an hour, well, hour in the creek and a half an hour on the side, I heard somebody scream my name because from the road up above, you can see people, but no one had passed by and I heard Jennifer and someone that was there and knew me, saw me, and then I was able to get out. So it took a little of assistance, but these are good reasons never to go by yourself. It's not necessarily an experience you want to learn without a guide. I stepped off the side of a road into snow that comes up past my waist and have to get pulled out. So you really never know what is right off side of these, these roads that are specific for snow coaches. Those are the ones that get the traffic. Everything else, you really don't know how deep it is sometimes or what you're walking into. So there is a safety factor. Yes, a guide I would highly recommend. Excellent questions. So let's talk a little more about connecting to the landscape. You know, when I photograph, um, I, I'm one of those people that like to reach out and touch something, right? And that's why I like the use of foreground details in photography. Um, I always feel that that connects the viewer to the place where I'm creating the photo. And, but with often just snow at my feet in very few foreground elements in certain areas of the park, I have to find other ways to create a sense of connection for the viewer. And I say this all the time, but I feel very fortunate that I get to go to all these amazing places. Uh, and I wanna be able to share that with everybody. So that's why this is important to me. So I wanna talk about the aesthetics that winter offers in Yellowstone. And you know, yes, standing in a blanket of snow looks as peaceful as it feels. But I also have found um, sometimes a really strong sense of isolation or survival. And you can feel that in the air sometimes. And when I get that sensation, I try and communicate these emotions with my images. You know, both peacefulness and isolation, these are really strong emotional responses. Um, they're very opposite, but powerful. So as photographers, we can put this emotion into our work, right? I mean, I found that winter photography is perfect for simplicity and minimalism. And I go to many locations specifically to photograph this feeling. Hayden Valley, for example, I mentioned that before, that is the valley on the Eastern circle of the park. It's known for abundant wildlife, but in winter, it's a landscape that screams, I mean, just screams solitude. You drive into that valley, it's so open and vast, you see no mountains, you know, maybe just some rolling hills that are covered with snow, and then you wonder what's out there, and you realize that it's not just, you know, you surviving <laughs> the day, it's everything that lives there. And then you look at it and you think, how can anything actually survive? It's so bare, but to create that sense of solitude that I feel when I'm there, I stick with the simplest elements and I work a lot with negative space to help communicate that feeling of isolation. You know, 
photography for me, I break it into three categories. It's, it's art, it's a storyteller, and it's a preserver of time. So when I get to a location, I think of those three things that photography is for me, and I try and decide what, which one of those I want to communicate. You know, there is a story here, isolation, emotion. I want people to connect. I want people to feel what I'm feeling when I'm there. And minimalism is a way to do that. And it's so naturally present there. Um, and minimalism, minimalism is, it's an art form that actually started in the 20th century, in the 50s and 60s, mainly in New York City. It was a huge departure from abstract um, art and photography. And while the art form spanned many different mediums, I mean, at the time it was very prominent in design and architecture. But then of course it led to painting and, and then photography. So what makes minimalism, well, minimalistic? In theory, it's the openness and freedom of interpretation without any direct or sometimes clear subject. So this is how minimalism is defined by its style. So in other words, the artist intent is for the viewer to interpret, not for the artist to tell. So it's a very different take on how we typically photograph nature because nature, we're usually in most cases looking at elements in a realistic format, right? I mean, we see nature, we want to capture it. It's beautiful. We have mountains and flowers and lakes and, you know, canyons and all this amazing stuff. But what happens when you don't have all of that, you know, it, it's time to think a little bit differently. And the key to minimalism is really to keep it simple. And I think that's the most defining factor of minimalism. Uh, understanding simplicity is step number one. And making the move from simplicity to minimalism as a style of photography requires a lot of thought and intent. So while minimalism is much easier to achieve in a whiteout, because everything's already white for you, when I'm trying to achieve this at other locations, um, I do a lot of long exposure. So I may not need a long exposure in the snow if everything's white, but you know, if I am at, um, let's say the beach and I want to just completely erase anything, but maybe one sea stack standing out, you know, that can also create some minimalism, even if it has color. Um, and a lot of what I've done at Yellowstone over the years has taught me how to visualize that when I get to locations that are not naturally minimalistic. On this shot and here, you want to, yes. someone wanted to know, how did you use the ND filter and how did you decide uh, what filters to use? Well, that's a great question. You know, I use um, this filter here is a graduated three stop soft um, GND filter. And do you use this and, a lot in the snow? I want to make sure we're talking about this image, correct? So when I look at a scene and this, I could see a little definition in the back, you know, there was a clear, clear line. I don't want to say clear, but I mean a difference in the land between the snow and what was behind it, which was basically a blizzard. It was snow moving across a wall of snow. And it was actually falling on me at the time as well. And I thought, well, I'd like to show these trees out there, but I'd also like to try and capture a little bit of, of what I'm seeing behind there, which is just a basic gradient in color. So I used uh, the three stop for that. And I just put the filter in and I, I make sure that I adjust it to where I see that visually with my eye. And then when I'm looking through the lens, I try and make sure it's positioned correctly. And you can see it darken the top of the trees a little bit, as well as that line, that defining line between the land and, and the cloud of snow basically coming through. 
And I always try and make those decisions when I'm out there. Um, I spend a lot of time considering what filters I'm going to use for every project that I do. So I actually carry a lot of filters with me. Um, I have a pouch that I can attach to my tripod and I also have a pouch I can attract um, attached to my side, to my hip, and sometimes I have filters all through all my pockets. Um, but I think it makes the difference between possibly a good photograph and a great photograph. But I consider these things when I'm looking at my scene. What can make this better? What do I want it to look like? What will this particular filter do for me? So I knew in this case, I didn't want it to be all perfectly white with just the trees. I did want a little bit of faded white in the background, and that's why I chose the three stop soft. And are you so shooting aperture priority? Oh, it's a great question. Um, no, I, well, the only time I use aperture priority is when I'm photographing wildlife because it eliminates the need of me having to consider one other element when wildlife is moving so quickly. Aperture priority for wildlife, I can choose either a 5.6 or an 8.0. That's usually the highest I ever go. And I can, um, you know, set my ISO, do a test exposure, and then I can follow the wildlife and everything that they're doing, check behind the camera sometimes, make sure the lighting hasn't changed. For anything else that I photograph, I do use manual mode. Um, I think that that is a, gr a great use of a camera and learning how to do that and make changes to your exposure as you're photographing can really allow you to create some beautiful art. You know, um, I'll get to some photos here in a little bit where you'll see that we have some storms coming over the valley and some of the filters and decisions I made at that time made images more dramatic than what I was seeing but it was still there. I mean, the drama was there. I just wanted to enhance it because to me, it was so powerful at the time. So, you know, understanding all of this is really important. You know, things you want to consider when you're doing photography, especially like in winter, focusing on minimalism, you look for lines, um, shape and contrast, and most important, negative space. So when I'm in the inner circle and most of these areas are very accessible, um, I always photograph them. I photograph them every year because they change. You know, you can never photograph something the same twice. The light may change, the amount of snow may change, a tree may fall down, you never know. But negative space really helps to set off that particular subject that you have chosen. So on this shot, and the negative space, why would you use the ND filter versus bracketing and post-processing? And then do you do, you do a lot of post-processing Lightroom or Photoshop? I do minimal pro processing. Um, you know, I've always been asked that question about using filters versus Lightroom. And I'm going to tell you now that the more information that you have in the raw file, the better image you are going to have. I use filters. I'll always use filters. I always have used Singray filters. They are the best. <laughs> but the reason that there are filters and there's been filters since the beginning of photography is because they work. And you cannot substitute that with processing. You might be able to make some adjustment, but why not get the art right in the field? You know, you may have to push your, say you don't, you choose not to use your filter that day. You're tired. You don't want to take it out of your, your bag or whatever. You could be missing such a great opportunity for a photograph that is just spectacular because you didn't add that four stops or three stops in while you were photographing. There are often times, you know, when you come back and you look at your processing image and you say, oh, I could have used a little more. I wish I put the three over the four and had seven stops of difference, you know, and th those things do happen. And sometimes four isn't enough and you have to make a slight adjustment in Lightroom anyway. But without that, imagine having to pull three or four stops of light down in the top two thirds of your image, like this one, to make the statement that you want to make. I, I do not believe in, in using Lightroom for this purpose. Lightroom should be used for minimal adjustments and some corrections, color corrections. And I believe that in processing overall. 
So if you're well, photographing well in this field, Sorry. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, the fun part is being out there photographing, not really sitting behind the computer trying to get everything processed. I'm so behind on my processing. It's, I mean, I, I realized I didn't even process Yellowstone last year when I got out there last week. It was like, wait a minute, where are these images? Oh yeah, I didn't process them. I mean, there is a time factor, but it's the quality. You know, when, when you're buying an expensive camera and gear and everything that goes along with it, why would you not use the tools needed to make the, the raw photo better? And I, you know, I say that all the time. I believe it. And I use filters all the time for that reason. Those are excellent questions. Audience always has great questions. We love them. Yeah, we've been having good ones. You know, take a look at these bison, for instance, you know, the snow covered bison in the shot. This is in Lamar Valley. We came up from the lake area, the West Lake of Yellowstone. Um, and we got into the valley. And just as we were coming into Lamar Valley, looks like I have a spot on it. Um, <laughs> negative space, everything around the bison in the trees is negative space. So, so the bison and the trees are the positive space and it's very minimal in there. But notice, you know, the snow really, it doesn't attract attention, right? Um, the statement here is isolation. It communicates something pretty powerful. I mean, this is a story of survival. These are a, a complete herd of bison, not too far from a set of trees in complete whiteout conditions. And these bison are either going to survive or they're not. Most of them, the young ones probably won't survive, some will. And you, you stand there and you look at this thing, scene and you think, gosh, you know, is that bison gonna make it? He's laying down. How, how do they survive? I mean, really, when it's that cold out, how do they survive? So there's a real strong emotional reaction to minimalism, not only when I'm taking the photo, but when I look at a photo um, that's, that I've taken or other people that have taken. Because unlike you know, art or design where minimalism started, we're using realistic elements. So these are story, these are story pieces here. Uh, the absence in mystery that can be created in whiteout conditions and minimalism and simplicity, you know, it allows the viewer to interpret what the image implies and possibly even what lies beyond. So there's a little bit of mystery, you know, with simplicity, you can take it a step further, work with the negative positive space. You can create some tension and mystery, drama, and even some illusion. And I think that's what's so incredible about Yellowstone. And you naturally have the landscape for that. So let's talk about mystery a little bit and creating some mystery. Um, and I, you had asked a question, someone had asked a question earlier about filters. And I do use a lot of filters when I'm photographing this area of the park. And now snowstorms can come from any direction. Um, but but the ones that come off the mountain range from the south seem to produ produce the best drama. Uh, usually I just go to the very top of Lamar Valley um, and not go into the valley, but just get, get right into that section of the park. And I wait, usually late afternoon, and the weather, it just presents itself. <laughs> and when this happens, I work really quickly to capture as many compositions as possible. I underexpose for drama. I overexpose for a sense of illusion. I move my lens constantly, look for the highlights. You know, where the highlight, the sun is hitting the snow, that's your highlight. And I look for the simplicity so that I can create images that feel really intense. But I cannot achieve this without some tools. Um, of course, one being filters that I'll talk about in just a second, but the other one is the tool of knowledge and the tool of understanding that if I look behind the lens and sometimes even just pull my eye away from the lens, I want to look at where that little bit of drama is, the most amount of drama, and then I wanna make sure I'm pointing my lens on that. So I'm constantly moving around. I'm a strong believer that there's always more than one photo in the same location you're standing out. You just have to look for it. 
Um, I took this photo. This was last year. I took some this year as well. Um, and like I said, afternoons are the best time of day because the sun comes through these clouds and it creates shafts of light. And you have all these trees on the hill. Some places have a minimal amount of trees, some have more trees, but you get these whirls of glow in the snow. And it really is a truly amazing experience behind the lens. And I return every year to this location specifically for that. But what makes this so wonderful is you're not just watching the, move, the weather system move in, it moves in and out with rhythm. So you get the snow where it's coming up and going out and it gets sucked back in and it gets sucked back out. You know, it's, You're so in tune with nature and it's really awe-inspiring. So when you have weather that's dramatic like this and it mixes with light, you have elements for really beautiful work. And I, I really use every tool I have in my bag and I take all of my tools out of my, you know, out of the vehicle, out of the car, because I'm usually driving there by myself on up in Lamar Valley, but I will have filters on my hips. Sometimes I want a cooling polarizer. Sometimes I want a warming polarizer. I use my warming polarizers actually quite a bit. This particular image, I believe, yes, I used a four stop soft with a warming polarizer and I underexposed. And then I would take another shot, see if I have one. That is from this year actually. And I used a four stop here as well with a warming polarizer, but I didn't underexpose on this one. So you can see the difference here and what you get. And a lot of these decisions are based of course on experience, trial and error, but I think that's really important is, is that we get out there and we try different things. I could not achieve this without a graduated neutral density filter. And I prefer the soft ones. That's just my preference. There's some really great ones out there, but I like the soft blend. Um, for me, that allows me to position the, the edge exactly where I want it to go. But using the four stop on this without the underexposing allowed me to get a little more light at the top of the image. But each one of these, you know, photos that I take from this location are ultimately different. Um, you know, what, another way to experience winter in Yellowstone is really just to look for the drama that nature presents. You know, yes, you can look for the simplicity and the minimalism and the white and the snow, but there's drama there too that comes with weather and winter storms. Chasing these storms honestly presents me with the best opportunities for capturing this magnificent light that displays during these storms. Yes. Now, do you go out with a tripod or the, or are you handheld? Do you use a filter holder? I do use a filter holder, absolutely. Um, I, and I use a tripod the majority of the time. I will say sometimes when I'm photographing wildlife, it is, if it's not something that's being very stationary, if it's moving around a lot, it's a little easier for me to handhold. I completely rely on my tripods. What the tripod forces me to do is really to stop, look, pay attention, make sure I'm getting it spot on. I don't have to worry about stability or anything else, you know. Um, I'm grounded and I can think creatively and I could look for things that I may not be focusing on if I'm sitting there worrying about, you know, this. And so I always have a tripod on truly for landscape or any kind of detail work like this, because I don't want to have to fight this inner thought about, you know, is the speed fast enough? Have I held still enough to get what I'm seeing? The tripod forces you to really tweak that composition to exactly what you want it to be. And how many camera bodies do you carry? I carry at least two in the winter time because ultimately one's not going to work. <laughs> I don't know. Something about the cold. I had a, my wildlife camera took an afternoon off last week. It just said, okay, I've had enough. And you know, it's a great camera, <laughs> but this happens sometimes. And I've had, you know, my cameras fail in, in high moisture conditions before, but usually they just have to rest and, you know, they're better the next day. They kind of get back to working condition on their own most of the time. 
but I do have two camera bodies. I have a wildlife camera body and I have um, I have the 1DX Mark II Canon and I have the Canon 5D Mark IV. So those two cameras are with me at all times. I do have a Canon mirrorless that's been converted to infrared that I've, I've not used much yet. I got it, I think right at the end of February last year. So minimal time to use it to, you know, in the places that I really wanna photograph. Um, but I'm looking forward to get that getting that one out. But you have one of the to best ask about infrared as well. Did you? Yeah, you know, I really want to get into it. I do a lot of black and white conversions on the photography. This shot here is not black and white. This was natural. Um, it's just that it is such a bright and dark set of dramatic clouds coming over trees and backlighting them. So they naturally look black and white. Well, this one here, that one actually was converted to black and white. So a lot of times you just get something really monochromatic, you know, just in a situation like this. But I do like black and white photography. Um, I do a lot of it and I love doing it. So. Uh, infrared, when I when I get to start to play with it a little bit more, will be interesting to see how this compares and how it challenges me creatively, because I think that's what every change does for a photographer, whether it's a new location, a new camera, a new technique, a new way of thinking, anything that we try that is different, we need to try that particular thing and maximize that trial so that we're learning from it. And when we understand how it affects the way we see things or how it technically affects our process, then that's something we can carry on to the next location we go to. So everything is a learning process that we do every single day at every location as well. Excellent questions. You know, what I really like about this, and it, if you look at some of my images, the majority of them look like this because it is my favorite place in the park. Um, but what's really nice about this is that you can drive on this road. You do not need a snow coach to get to Lamar Valley. This year is open round year, you know, year round. Um, but in the winter time, it's much less populated than other seasons, even though you can drive it yourself. When you're passing vehicles, a lot of them are just going over to Cook City, which is the very last stop on that road because you have a lot of people who take snowmobiles and not into the park, but up into the Beartooth Highway in the mountains in that region. Um, snow plows come through and, and during daylight hours, which is really good. They clean the roads. But I will say in Lamar Valley, if you're driving yourself, there is very little room for error when driving. I mean, that trip I took last week on my first day alone, there were four vehicles that had gone off the road. Now, no one was hurt, you know, the drop-offs aren't that bad necessarily, you know, most of them anyway, I guess it could be. Usually there's just driving off the side of the brim of the road and they're going into four or five feet of snow because they didn't realize it. Um, so you always have to drive very cautiously in this area. Um, I think it's important to know where to go um, and to pull over and explore with your eyes and lens, not behind the wheel, you know, just get out. There's some parking areas. You can get out, you can walk a little bit. Um, and I, I think that's the way to experience Yellowstone Little Mar Valley. And you want to talk about white balance, um, like what white balance do you use? Do you adjust the Kelvin and how do you decide on the temperature? I will tell you, I don't want to sound lazy, but I always use auto white balance. I really do. I, I am happy with what I get in white balance. And if I get something back in processing in Lightroom, it is easier for me to make a decision there because I can compare the different options. Um, I use white balance for absolutely everything, even night photography, even though I'm not supposed to. <laughs> but I'm a rule breaker. What can I say? Um, I, I trust auto white balance with my camera system. It has served me very well. And on the rare occasion where something doesn't look quite right, I can um, adjust that in processing. Now, winter actually can be quite hard to photograph in because you've got a lot of white. Um, and, and your cameras aren't going to read everything. The meter usually doesn't read everything accurately. So a lot of times I overexpose because it's going to read that white as a gray. 
But the most important thing for winter photography, wherever you are, if you're in a white condition, a lot of white, and especially if you have dark trees and dark animals, you have to pay attention to your histogram. I may compose my landscapes very carefully behind um, the camera on a tripod, but I rely on the histogram to tell me where I am, not the LCD screen on the back. So when my image pops up, it pops up very small, um, but it has the Instagram for black and white beside it. I, I don't worry about the color histogram here, just the black and white. I wanna make sure that my whites are not in the center because that would be 50% gray. Snow's not 50% gray. I boost that to the right, but I also have to make sure that it is not blowing out. I mean, you gotta have data and information. So that's something, you know, if you do underexpose, a lot of, you know, shadow and exposure can be adjusted in, in, in fixed in Lightroom. But when you learn to adjust in that histogram and capture that histogram at that right point for snow, it's usually for me about 75% to the right. Um, this doesn't affect the, the wildlife too much. You know, bison are very dark, moose are very dark. Uh, some of these trees are very dark depending on the lighting conditions. Um, but you, you just really can pull back, you know, or add a little black in when you're processing if they seem to be a little bit blown out. So auto white balance is my go-to tool. I don't want to worry about that when I'm in the field. Excellent questions. So do you take notes as you shoot? How do you remember what filters and all you used? I would say, you know, early on I took notes all the time. I had cheat sheets in my bag. I was famous for that. You know, I'm a composition girl. So with my background in design, everything is about composition. And that, that's kind of where I started. And then it was understanding how to see the light. Um, but I had cheat sheets literally on how to do a specific setting. I would print it out on my computer. I would laminate it. I'd put it in my bag. If I had to pull it out and look at something because I, I couldn't remember something, then I would look at it. At this point, most of it is memory based because I do, I photograph all the time. I mean, I'm, I think in 2019 and 2020, no, let's take that back. 2018 and 2019, I was home maybe 25 to 30 days a year. 2020, we won't talk about it. I was home a lot <laughs> as the rest of us were. But, um, you know, if I'm not home that much. I, I photograph all the time. When I'm home, I typically haven't photographed a lot, but I did here, you know, I had some fun with flowers and just about everything else I could think of this summer. And it was a lot of fun. It was different. Great. Do you have a, a I'm looking, we have a bunch of questions here, but I, do you want to get through your slides and then we'll revisit the question? Sure. Yeah, okay. at any time. If you think a question is relevant, we'll just okay. obviously go through them. I didn't, I didn't want you to run um, out of time to get to your material. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about winter light. You know, um, the storms I was just talking about, you know, those are really intense to witness. And there is nothing quite as magical as the soft light in, in a winter morning when it breaks through the clouds. It shines a little inspiration on the landscape and I love that. Now in winter time, you don't always get uh, sunlight breaking through the clouds, but when it happens, I mean, it's really magical. It, when you watch it happen, there's an area up around Norris Geyser Basin that has both geysers and, and streams and stuff like that. It just, when the sun comes out, that's the place I want to to be because you can feel it almost warming the trees, right? I mean, look at these trees, they're isolated, they're frozen, and the sun comes out and warms them. And, and you feel like, oh, it's warming the trees, and then you feel the sun warm yourself. You know, it's almost like they're desperate for sun. And the glow on the landscape it creates, you know, it really warms the soul. When this occurs, everything unique to Yellowstone really starts to sparkle. Um, the light, it dances on the snow and photographers begin to run from tree to tree to get these images. Um, and then they go to the streams and they get the rocks. Everything is like almost perfectly ready for your camera and you just get to hop around and think about your composition and your design. Now this light that occurs, it is fleeting. 
and but it is so incredibly inspiring that you will completely forget that it is 10 below zero uh, until you've exhausted every photo possibility <laughs> within sight or if the sun goes away. Uh, these are these are happy moments, you know, not only for us, but of course for nature itself. Winter is harsh and Yellowstone has the harshest winter conditions in the lower 48. And we usually think about survival when it comes to wildlife, but what about the forest? What about the trees, the small things that make up this grand landscape? The sun highlights the sometimes forgotten pieces of the, of the nature of the park. And as photographers, we we see beauty. I think where sometimes uh, you know other people do not. They we recognize it. That's why we're photographers and artists because we can see beauty in the little things too. You know, the west side of that inner circle um, has a lot of petrified trees, like I mentioned, and but there's living trees as well that you can tell are just hoping to survive the winter. You know, some of them are about to fall over. You know, is it going to be standing next year when you get back? There's so many lives um, that depend on this cycle of weather and seasons that occur in this particular park. Um, it's a great place to position yourself for that morning sun, especially if it's, it's expected because the number of photo opportunities really are endless. You know, in a short amount of time, you can travel from the lower geyser basin which is probably only maybe a 20 minute drive. Um, and if the roads are kind of plowed down a little bit from the snow coaches, usually about a 20 minute drive all the way up to Norris Geyser Basin where this was taken, um, where you get that backlit sun in the morning and then the fog rises you know, from the steam and there is a geyser across the street and if the wind blows in the right direction it comes across the valley in front of you, it hits your back and it is warm, it's amazing. You feel a sense of warmth and it goes by you and then you start to feel a little cold because there's a lot of moisture in it. But that little bit of drama, that little bit of steam, it makes tree branches sparkle with this golden light and if you happen to get a little blue sky, it's really spectacular. It's a wonderful experience. So winter light, you know, generally because there's limited daylight anywhere that you photograph in the winter, if the, the sun is very low to the horizon, you already naturally have um, a day where you can really capture a lot of photographs. I mean, I will be out in the winter time from sunrise to sunset and I don't stop shooting all day. I don't think there's been a moment where there weren't photo opportunities or lighting conditions in these winter months to be able to continue to photograph. It's not like, oh, it's too bright outside. <laughs> if there happens to be a bright spot, it's not going to last. And if it does, just drive a half an hour down the road and I guarantee it's gonna be snowing. Can you flip back two images? Mm -hmm. We wanted to know, Carlos wants to know, what's your reasoning for shooting F-22 um, and are you darkening the sky or the foreground with your filter? Actually, I was darkening the sky because I was shooting into the sun. Um, the reason for F-22 sometimes is more uh, a matter of me not changing my f-stop. When I get to these locations, a lot of times there are ripples in the snow or um, whether it's going this way or the ripples and shadows are coming this way. Usually when I photograph, um, I mentioned a little while ago, I'm a huge fan of foreground detail. So I was probably trying to get some stuff low to the ground. And then I saw this composition I, as I was doing it and I just you know stood up a little bit higher and took this photo without changing my f-stop. So technically there was no reason for the f-22. It was just something that didn't get changed from that session. And um, what, did you know, it, mm -hmm. what effect does the polarizer have on your snow images? Well, the snow, snow is actually very reflective. It's just like water. So when the light hits it, sometimes it can almost blow out. Mm -hmm. You want to get enough um, glow. You want to get enough shine when the, when the sun is hitting it, but you don't want it to blow out. So the polarizer helps me to control that. 
And then the graduated neutral density filter in this case allowed me to shoot into the sun and be able to bring down that exposure. You could see the sun very well behind the tree. It's not, I mean, it is a white spot, but it is not a blown out white spot. Uh, and I wouldn't have been able to achieve that if I didn't have actually both of those tools on my camera at that time. And do you use hyperfocal point or focus tack? Excellent. Who asked me that question? Not really. <laughs> um, all the time. You know, when I'm doing my um, creative composition talks, I, I talk about hyperfocal distance and stuff. You know, when I got into understanding and learning a camera, I, I was not a technical person. I'm from the artistic side and learning the difference between an f-stop and aperture why do you have two words for it? You know, some of these things just kind of blew my mind. It's like it didn't make any sense. And um, when someone said hyperfocal distance to me, I mean, my jaw dropped. It's like, hands up, I'm done. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. But now it's so simple. And yes, I use it. I use my hyperfocal distance all the time. And what's nice is that I've learned where that hyperfocal distance, that actual calculation is for each lens that I use. So now that it's in my memory, for the most part, I don't have to refer to a calculator to determine what that is. But hyperfocal distance is hugely important. You know, generally a rule would be saying, um, let's see if I can get over it here you would photograph now this tree was probably 50 yards away um with hyperfocal distance in this shot it wouldn't have been a concern because i don't have anything in the foreground that's that's a concern this is this is snow but if i were really low to the ground and i had some snow um billowing snow or some you know something like that some texture to the snow that would have been an issue. But something like this, this would have been an issue. This, I was low to the ground. So hyperfocal distance here, I would have applied it with the camera that I was using and I would have put my focal point on that. But a general rule is that hyperfocal distance point for most cameras lies somewhere about one third into the flat two-dimensional surface of your photo, not the distance the flat surface when you're just using that guideline of one third up your photo, one third up of the image. Um, but let's see, um, hyperfocal distance is important. And if you're new to it and, and not familiar with it, you know, get a DOF calculator. There's so many of them out there that are for free. You download the app. Once you learn it, you know, the only time you may have to relearn something is when you introduce a new lens into your system or possibly update your camera, then you do have to relearn it. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Hyperfocal distance is a scary word, but it's really not that scary. <laughs> Let's see. Talk about that. Am I going backwards? I think I might be. <laughs> Where was I? I was with wildlife. There we go. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk about wildlife. You know, wildlife awakens every morning in those early morning hours of every season, um, you begin to see wildlife. And especially in this park, in the forests and the streams, you know, the moose, they walk the streams and they, and they come out of the forest and the fox, you always find fox out for the morning hunt and the bison, when they begin to get up, you know, it's remarkable. They're in these herds together, very close knit, but when they get up and it snowed overnight, they have all this, uh, you know, snow on their back that they have to shake off and they're covered in snow. It's really amazing to see. Um, but most of the animals, you know, they're up at the crack of dawn, but for us, it's still a little too dark to photograph. But I've always believed that being on time with your camera to spot them is crucial. And preparing your equipment before arriving is also extremely important. So because wildlife work on their own schedule, and they do not wait for humans or tolerate us much either for very long, being in the right environment um, for the animal you want to locate and having all of your gear ready to quickly photograph and having patience is really crucial to successfully photograph wildlife and especially in winter. And why winter makes such a difference, you know, is 
Well, one, the animals, they really stand out in the snow. They're easier to spot, but they also have a low level of energy that they need to conserve. So they are up and down pretty quickly. And it's important to understand that because the impact that you could have on wildlife could affect their ability to survive. So you have to go in very responsibly. It's not like summertime or spring when they're up and everything's out and they have you know, many opportunities to eat. They have to conserve their energy to survive. Um, you know, overall, there's never been a bigger draw to Yellowstone for visitors or photographers than the desire to see and photograph wildlife. And each area of the park has multiple species and some that are unique to certain terrains. So on every trip I've taken over the years, I've seen bison, elk, moose, um, wolves, black-tailed deer, red and gray fox, coyotes, bighorn sheep, seen doll sheep, trumpeter swans, bald and golden eagles, and in certain months, um, black bears and grizzly. And then of course more, because there's a lot of smaller animals I haven't talked about. But it is amazing in winter. Um, because the wildlife is so easy to spot because of the snow. And I, I feel personally that the snowy background really enhances the beauty of the animal itself because it's not competing with a background necessarily. So when going to Yellowstone in winter, you're going to see wildlife. It's a given. Um, but knowing where to go for which animal you want to photograph is really important, especially if there's something specific that you want to photograph. Now, I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. When does your day start, like getting ready and getting out into the field? And how long do you stay out? Good question. Well, we'll take last week, for instance, because that's fresh in my mind. Sunrise was just about 7.52 a.m. And like I said, I was specifically in Lamar Valley and I stayed in Cook City. I was out the door at 6 a.m. And because I drive really slow in the snow and the roads aren't plowed at that time of day, um, <laughs> I'm driving very slow until I get to some of the areas where there's a, you know, a little opening in the tree, some light starts to come in naturally and I can see what I'm doing. So I leave at six and I'm back at six. Um, sun goes down about five o'clock and usually I, you know, get back to the room about six o'clock, sometimes a little later. Sometimes there was one day out there, there was a blizzard, complete whiteout. And I thought, well, I, this, it's almost not safe to drive. And I drove all the way through Lamar Valley. I was actually at the eastern end of the park. So I had about an hour to drive slowly and the snow didn't let up. And I thought, well, I could stay out and look for animals or I could get back safely. So sometimes you have to make a call like that, but usually about 12 hours, which doesn't seem long, actually. Not compared to, you know, summer sunrises <laughs> and sunsets. It was brutal. <laughs> what is mm -hmm. the longest lens you use for wildlife and do you ever use auto ISO? Uh, okay, good question. I have my primary wildlife lens that I use because of its ease um, and its flexibility is the 1 to 400 and I will sometimes put a 1.4 extender on that. I do have an 800 millimeter lens that I use for some wildlife photography. There are times obviously when you cannot get close enough to wildlife. Um, usually things like the wolves are a bit far off in the distance and you know if I'm in other locations that's Yellowstone specific but when I'm in Florida I, I have a little bit of a fear of alligators so I tend to use the 800 for that but uh, I you know the, both of them have great value um, but the flexibility and ease to use that one to 400 and an extender if I need it has been a really great lens um, so I would say that's my primary go-to lens for wildlife. And what was the second question? Um, do you use auto ISO? Oh, you know, I don't. I never use auto ISO. Uh, and the reason I think maybe more a, a learning lesson was when I am photographing with some of the groups that I, that I take out and people are using auto ISO. I mean, sometimes that thing shoots up to 32,000 ISO or something crazy. And it, I don't think it's necessary. I, my photos and my camera system, you know, 800, 
1000 those are the best do i go up to 1600 if it's a really great shot and an animal is actually very close to me and i need 1600 because i need the speed then yes of course i will but i i think it's a quality issue when you get to a place where the iso is actually that high now i know that some cameras can handle it and it can be great for night photography but um I prefer not to use auto. I always do a test shot when I get out. So if I see wildlife or if I'm waiting for wildlife, this is part of being prepared if I haven't seen wildlife, but I'm in an area where I know a moose is present or where the coyotes come across the valley daily, I will go ahead and take a test shot when I arrive. And even though maybe this coyote wasn't there, I could use some of the sage in the background to get a good reading and know where to set my ISO. And then I just pay attention to it. I look at the back of the camera, I look at the histogram, and I make any adjustments that I need to make as I'm photographing. Um, I realize ISO takes the, um, you know, that extra step out of having to think of a setting on a camera, but I think from some of the things that I have seen, it's better to keep your ISO better controlled. So I do not use auto ISO. And then back to lenses quickly, do you use any tilt shift lenses? You know, I, I have a tilt shift lens. I, I use it some, but you know, I find that I just don't travel with it that much. Um, it's a 17 that I have. It's really good for places like if I'm going to, and this is off of the path of nature or wildlife photography, but I, you know, I go up to Bodie, ghost town, and I do Trans Allegheny sometimes. So if I'm going to do an interior or something cool like that, then having that tilt shift can be a really nice benefit. I know it works well for some landscapes, especially if you have a lot of really nice flowers, say Mount Rainier, you get all those flowers in the foreground and you have mountains in the background. It, it's very wonderful for a place like that, but I find I really just don't take the time to do it. And I, I'm really happy with what I'm getting with my other cameras, but they're fantastic lenses. Excellent. All right. Well, since access, let's talk about wildlife a little bit more. But since access to the park roads is limited because of the snow coach, um, with the exception of Lamar Valley, the northern route, um, you can get a lot of wildlife. You know, for example, when I'm in Lamar Valley, I get everything from wolves to coyotes to fox. Um, there is an area up there that at the confluence of the uh, Lamar River that has an outcropping of rocks. And if you stop there and look up, almost every time I see bighorn sheep. So that's something that's really nice and kind of unique to see in that area. Of course, you can see them as you go out of the park into Gardner as well. But they come out very close to the road there. They're high up, um, but it's a nice thing to see eagles and golden eagles and bald eagles and, and they're present really everywhere. Anytime I want to look for wildlife, especially for wolves, I look for birds. That's kind of the key. If you see ravens and eagles flying somewhere, there's a kill site nearby. If there's a kill site, there's an animal on it um, or nearby. So that's something that I always look out for. Now, when I go into Hayden Valley. Mm -hmm. oh, I just said that's a great tip. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Hayden Valley that's on the inner circle on the east side, that's a, that's a lot different than Lamar, actually. Um, it has the river that runs through on the east side of it. That entire river has usually a really nice grouping of trumpet or swans. So that's another thing that I like about that area. It does have a lot of wolves. You see fox and coyote and you see bison. I think you see bison just about everywhere. Um, a lot in the geothermal areas, but surprisingly a whole lot of them are in these valleys. Um, but I like that side of the park a lot, specifically for the trumpeter swans. You get along the river a little bit closer. You could stand on the edge of the river there and get some really nice photos. You can also see otters and, and things like that. So it's got a little bit of a different feel to it than the Lamar Valley. But like I said, knowing where to go for what you want to photograph, or even if you're going to go to both places, knowing what to expect as far as wildlife is very important. 
that'll help you be prepared in your car. When I get either in the snow coach or the car, I have two cameras out. I have one that has my one to 400 with an extender on because I don't know what I'm going to see right away. And I may be able to want to stop quickly, get in a parking area, pull over safely and start photographing. I don't want to have to go in my backpack and assemble everything. So being prepared is really important. And knowing what might be out there can help you select the right camera, the right lens, the, the right filter. So if I'm just kind of going through Lamar Valley, I, I know one, okay, I, I'll probably see a wolf. Um, I'm definitely going to see a fox and a coyote, but I'm going to go here and think in terms of the trumpeter swans because I don't see them in the northern part of the park or anywhere else outside of Jackson Hole, which is down in the Tetons, of course. So I'm prepared for things like that that I want to photograph. I'm going to have a, a cooling, uh, I'm sorry, a neutral polarizer on instead of my warming polarizer because it's a white bird and it's a cool stream. And that's usually how I decide what filter I'm going to use. You know, what is the animal? If I know I'm going to go past an area that's prone to coyotes, I'm going to have my warming polarizer on. I always use a polarizer with wildlife. I think that's really important. Um, I get better photos. There is more, I don't want to say definition, but it increases um, everything, the contrast just a little bit. You can reduce the reflection if you need to. You can increase the reflection if you need to. And you get a little bit of that glare off that sometimes snow and white can present. Um, how do you Hayden Valley actually has. How do you decide? Pardon? How do you decide on the warming polarizer versus the neutral polarizer? I decide based on the wildlife that I'm photographing. So, you know, if it's a coyote, a coyote is warm, a bison is warm, a, um, you know, a fox is warm in color, a wolf is warm. So a lot of those times that's when I'm using my warming polarizer. If I want to photograph a white bird to me, especially in the water that has a sense of, of, of neutral, of a, a cooler tone. So I'm going to use my neutral one. Um, there are times though, like this past week I photographed, I had a um, cooling or the neutral polarizer on. I, I think in my head in terms of warm and cool, but that's not true. It's warm and neutral. But I came across a coyote, still had the neutral on. I, I didn't change the lens. I didn't really have time. I went ahead and photographed it and that's fine. It still looked good. But I think knowing what to expect helps you to make that choice. I do the same thing with wild uh, landscapes. So if I know that a landscape is going to have some sun to it, or possibly, which I'll get to in a little bit, some of the geothermal areas have a lot of warm tones to them. Some of them have cool tones. I make that decision based on, on the colors. So good question. And you know what? There's no right and wrong. There's not. There's no harm in taking a photograph with a neutral polarizer, even if the, the wildlife is cool toned and in it would look just as beautiful. It just looks different. So these are choices I have made over, you know, years of photographing, looking at things, seeing the way I like them. I tend to go towards the warm side, but just about everything I do, but that's just my personal preference, I guess. Excellent questions. All right. Well, here, let me talk about Lamar Valley just a little bit more because I do want to say Lamar really does have a huge concentration, but that does require a snow coach. So if you go into the park, you do a snow coach, stay at the snow lodge, um, make sure that you have someone that gets you into Lamar Valley early and plan to spend the day there because the open vastness of these rolling hills really provides a lot of opportunities for a variety of animals that you may not get when you get up to Lamar Valley. So Hayden is really nice. But Lamar Valley is it's larger and it is accessible. 
Uh, I think the road spans for 56 miles between um, Gardner and Cook City and the trains are different. So you will go through, when you come through Gardner, you get to Mammoth. Mammoth has some hot springs, really interesting to photograph there. And you usually see a lot of elk and black tailed deer over there. Um, when you get further into the valley, it becomes, it's not forested anymore. You lose the forest and, and you have valley and that's where you start to see your bison, coyote, and, and stuff again. Elk are very present in the uh, wooded areas. I don't see them a whole lot on the open plains, but I know they're there because there's always a kill site almost every day in that area. There was a, I had missed, I was sitting there, you know, I mean, this happens to everybody. I get the butt shots all the time. Right? I mean, it's going to happen. You're going to get butt shots shots before you get the face of an animal and you're going to miss an animal. I was sitting in my vehicle. It was about seven in the morning. The light started to show through. I was a little cold. I was sitting there for maybe 10, 15 minutes, just kind of looking around, got out of the car to see if I could see anything. I'll carry binoculars with me sometimes. I didn't see anything. I came back a half an hour later and right behind me, a quarter mile down the road, there was a kill site. It was up on the road a little bit, so it would have taken some searching. I missed it initially, but you know, that stuff happens, but knowing where to go and planning really, really helps. The only thing I could say is the possibilities for wildlife in this park are endless. It takes, it takes patience. It takes a lot of determination and a really good understanding of how to photograph wildlife, especially that particular species. Um, so personally, I do use Aperture Priority. I talked about that. And I always start my ISO at 800. That's kind of my starting point. And I will put my f-stop at 5.6. And then I check my exposure. I take a test shot. I do. I can, if I think I'm going to be photographing in this area and the light is what it is right now, and I'm going to stay there and wait for wildlife or look for it, I see something off in the distance, I can do a test shot. And then I'm ready when the wildlife comes a little bit closer. But I also want to say wildlife, if, if you haven't been to Yellowstone, wildlife in every season, including winter, they move really fast and a lot faster than you. They have, especially the larger animals, they have a really big stride. So a moose will take a step that might equal 10 steps of mine. Um, so one, you need a lot of speed, um, but you also have to be careful about photographing that dark animal on white snow. And most of the time I do overexpose my wildlife shots to the point where the whites are, you know, about 75, 75 to 80% to the right of my histogram, but I'm not blowing it out. Um, it, and the only time an exception to this would be, would be like with the trumpeter swans I just showed where the scene is white, the animals are white, that histogram doesn't have to be pushed quite as far. But when photographing in the snow, it's really hard to rely on that meter for exposure, especially when you have an animal that's, you know, very dark brown and you have snow that's very bright and white. So I always, always, always use my histogram to make the right decision on exposure. But photographing wildlife is more than just getting the shot. Um, the best images to me are the ones that capture the moment that the wildlife does something unique. And I refer to this as the it factor. You know, every person, every place, everything has something unique about it. And wildlife has exceptional unique qualities. So before I go out to photograph, I research. I research what animals I'm going to see, their behavior, their habits, what makes them special, what makes them different. You know, once I understand this characteristic, I can study the animal I'm going to photograph to capture a moment that tells a story, something more than just a portrait, something that makes that animal, you know, it, unique. Capturing the moment, that it factor, is more than a portrait and it becomes a story. And for winter in Yellowstone, that story often is the story of survival.
Now, I will say, you know, photographing safely is imperative for both yourself and for the wildlife. Animals depend on their energy level for survival and causing an animal agitation or to run from you is taking energy needed to survive the winter. And if you notice that the wildlife has noticed you, it's time to quietly back away. I also have found, and I, I realize people gather in groups when they see animals, a lot of you know, visitors and photographers will come to one place and everybody kind of talks really loud. And I think to myself, you know, I don't talk when I'm watching wildlife because I don't want to cause them to hear me. I mean, that's a distraction for them. They're going to hear people. You get to Yellowstone, a lot of these animals understand that people come there to visit. Um, they have acclimated at least to that point where they see traffic on the roads and people visiting it around. But it does two things to be quiet during your photo session. So if you're in a group and people are getting loud, you know, I usually step away or, you know, it's hard to tell people, you know, be quiet. I don't want to say shh. But, you know, personally, if you're out there photographing with maybe yourself and a friend, understand that being quiet, quiet, it helps keep the wildlife from being affected from sounds that are not natural to them. So they act more natural. And that's important for our photos. And it also really helps you to focus on what you're doing. You're not being distracted. When, just a quick story, I was in Lamar Valley last week and there was a coyote who was walking the road. Animals will walk the roads a lot, um, whether they're snow plowed roads or whether they're snow coach roads, because it doesn't cost them all that energy they have to burn to walk in snow that could be, you know, anywhere from six, six inches to three feet deep. It takes a lot to do that. So you will see animals walking the road when no one's around and then they kind of jump off the road and go their way. This one coyote, he just kept walking up the road for like half a mile and an impatient driver started to really push him to run faster and faster. And I understand you got somewhere to go. Maybe someone has to go to work or catch a flight or something. But I think it's important to know that anything that you do has an impact on wildlife. And if in winter you have to conserve energy to get from one day to the next, maybe it'll help you to think a little bit differently how to do that. You know, it's easy to pull over and wait for that coyote to go on his own off, off of the road into the snow. But, you know, always research before you photograph. I think that's the most important thing I can say. Um, keep a safe distance from all wildlife. I mean, bison and, and moose and elk, they're extremely dangerous. Their walking stride is so, so long. And I remember the first time I came across a moose and I was back country, this was not winter. And I didn't know he was there, but I came to this area that was back country and he made a noise when I came up and I started to back away and he took one step. He was probably 30 steps away, 30 feet away. And in that one step, he cut that distance nearly in half. I was like, oh my gosh, you know? So, you know, you just back up quietly, but you have to recognize that their stride is long and they can be so close to you within moments. And even when there are a couple feet of snow, you know, it, they can still maneuver. They're built for this. They're made to survive this condition. We are not. So taking a step in three feet of snow is much harder for us than it is for them. So we have to keep ourselves safe. We have to keep the animals, the wildlife safe. Um, smaller animals like coyotes and fox. Mm -hmm. You touched on walking in three feet of snow. Someone wants to know, how do you keep your tripod from sinking in? I use my tripod as a walking stick. There you go. Yep. I never know how deep the snow can be in front of me. So if I am doing something like walking down into a stream or a creek, um, I have my gear in my backpack, but I have my tripod out extended as if it were a ski pole um, or something just to determine because there are times I put it down and it just goes too far. It's like, this is the wrong way to go. Yeah. And I have to backtrack and find a different way to get down there. Um, so that's, that's actually a very effective tool. Um, but, you know, animals. Do you wear snowshoes yourself? You know what? I have not, I wear snow boots and I wear um, tracks, you know, so I have three different sets of tracks. I have some that are just 
the spiral ones where I can step out of a hotel with boots on and, and go get something to eat. They're not going to damage carpet or anything like that. I have a, a mid set that has some, some more grip to it. It's almost like a cylindrical um, shape to the track itself where there's some diamond edges and I can wear those in locations where the snow isn't deep but if the snow is deep I put on spikes that are quite deep and I also now that I want to mention it um, thought about it I want to mention that I use two different kinds of tripod feet on the tripods out there I do not use rubber feet on my tripods for winter they typically just slide around and that's not safe for your gear or for you um, so I use the, the ice spikes that are really long and I also use the ice cleats um, and I carry both of those with me and like I said I carry two tripods so I always have one or the other on me to keep safe. And on these last two pictures can you talk about why you use the Hilux protective filter? Yes because you know I may not have a polarizer on at a certain time, but if my polarizer is not on that camera at that moment, I'm always in winter going to have a protective filter. Um, winter is very harsh and I don't want my lens to freeze. <laughs> you know, a filter is replaceable. You can get new filters, but you have to protect the lens as well. So if I don't have a polarizer that I'm using, I'm going to have protection on that camera. And if I haven't decided and I have my other filters in my pocket before I get out with my backpack, they're going to have that UV filter on. I've become very quick at <laughs> changing <laughs> filters. You know, I mean, that's just something you do. It's like, and you're done because you're used to it because you do it, you know, 300 days a year or something like that. that so in winter, you have to cover your lens. That mm -hmm. leads into another question. So I wanted to add though, that the Singray protective UV uh, filter is actually a warming uh, filter. It has the tiniest bit of warming effect on the, mm -hmm. on the photos, which people usually It like. does, yeah. Um, it does, and I like that. Someone As I mentioned, I like things warm. Oh yeah, sorry. Someone wanted to know, how do you change your filters in the snow with your gloves on? <laughs> yeah, no one's quite made the perfect glove yet, right? No. I have two sets of gloves that I, that I wear. And then I have, I actually travel with an extra bag of clothes in my car, second pair of boots, socks, a second hat, a second turtle, um, a second pair or two or three extra pair of gloves, some really solid mittens that I can't use, but if I got stuck or broke down, I'm going to stay warm. And of course, you know, foot warmers, hand warmers and things like that. I have a very thin pair of like, um, neoprene gloves that I can actually operate everything with. But over top of that, once I'm done and everything's set up and I'm, I'm photographing, I can pull out of my pocket, these wool gloves that I have trying to think of the name of them. I might have to look that up. Uh, someone gave me uh, a set of gloves a couple of years ago and they were fantastic. And they're wool, so they get caught on Velcro. Mm -hmm. I replace them about once a year. They're only $40, but um, I can change everything with the thin neoprene gloves. If I have to stand, I put the other gloves on top. I think that, you know, you gotta keep yourself warm and hand warmers in your pockets. And how do you handle the thermal condensation on your equipment going from cold to warm? How long do you do you warm things up or cool things down? Yeah, no, that's a good question. You know, we'll talk about safety a little bit here. Let me go ahead and see if that's the next category. It is not. Um, keeping your gear safe. We talked a little bit about the brittleness of gear in certain temperatures, but there are certain locations in the park, especially when you're getting around to geothermal areas that produce steam. Um, as soon as the steam evaporates, it creates ice almost immediately. So you have to be really careful with your filters and your lenses. If I get steam, if I get, if I'm in steam, I know I'm in steam, I'm going to develop ice. So I have all my filters with me. Once I get a shot, I may walk away from the steam. I'm going to change my filter, gently put it in its case. I'm going to put a different filter on. I'm going to continue to photograph. And then when I get back into whatever vehicle I happen to be in, then I'm going to allow that to defrost. Um, never scrape ice 
or anything off of your lens. You just have to let it defrost and then you wipe it off with a lens cloth and get it dried up. As far as camera gear, um, you know, my camera is staying outside in temperatures that at most are about 60 degrees inside of a vehicle. I don't warm my vehicle up. I wear clothing to keep myself warm. Um, so 60 degrees is still a big difference than potentially minus 10, but I allow things to acclimate and I don't turn the heat on. I don't turn the defrost on. I keep everything in the back of the vehicle. Um, that way it's not close to even heat at 60 degrees. And when I get back to my room um, at the end of the day to try and keep any condensation or um, I guess, you know, even fog developing in the camera, I, I actually take all of the gear out of the bag and I set it out in the room because the bag has moisture too. And I let everything dry naturally. And then in the morning, I make sure everything's wiped down clean because there could be some moisture on it. Put it all back in my bag. My bag is nice and dry and I head back out. Excellent questions. All right, let's talk a little bit about the colors of Yellowstone. Since we were talking about steam, that takes us right to the geothermal features. You know, when it comes to winter, most of it, most of the park and everything I've talked about is really stark white and bare. It's, it's surreal. But there is one area of the park that is filled with all the colors imaginable. And that's the west side of the inner circle where I think the best geothermal areas are in the park. This is from Old Faithful up to Grand Prismatic. Um, we have not only those grand, wonderful locations, but you also have a lot of smaller, striking pools. Um, and these are in the mid and upper geyser basins. So while these colors are spectacular any time of the year, during the winter season, set against white, they really become even more contrasting by nature. And Grand Prismatic is, well, I mean, of course it's grand, but not only because of its size, but because of the variation in color, um, the lines and the textures within the earth really, really pop. And the steam will cause ice to form and melt in front of your eyes. And it creates really dramatic conditions for unique and really interesting photography. Um, I always use a polarizer for these locations because these are basically pools of water with color underneath them. So I really want the colors that are there to pop. So I use a polarizer to bring out the colors. Again, if, if I'm using a warming polarizer, it's because maybe the tones in the earth are warm. If they're cooler blues with some of the blue pools and I go to the neutral polarizer. And if I incorporate any sky or background into my image, I'm using a graduated neutral density filter, three or four stop, um, depending on the lighting conditions. Grand Prismatic really is one of the best trails to take in winter. And there's more than just that one amazing spring on that same trail. It's not the easiest trail to walk. Um, it probably is a mile. It's all boardwalk. So it's very, very nice. And they do somewhat maintain that boardwalk. Um, but there's so many features there and things you can photograph. You can literally spend hours there and, and not not even capture everything and that's what's so amazing about winter is because the light is so consistent or it changes slightly you may have a little sun maybe it gets bright for a half an hour and then it gets gray and snowy so every time you go back you get a different photo it's almost like you can't go to yellowstone and get the same photo twice because the weather is always changing but as great as grand Pres prismatic is and that whole basin there my favorite area for color in the park is actually the lower geyser basin, which has even more intense color. Um, in fact, the variety of color is even greater than Grand Prismatic. Um, and the lower geyser basin has a trail that loops around many different sizes. 
in colors of these ge geothermal features. And that's great for landscape photography. And always using polarizers and when incorporating any background or sky, I'm using my GND filter to capture the drama that nature's just presenting. I mean, there's colors from blue to green to aqua to browns. It's pretty amazing. Um, and unlike other areas in the park in the winter, the geothermal features, you know, they're unique to Yellowstone. So it's not just a winter thing, it's a Yellowstone, but I think they look better in winter because you have all this white that makes them beautiful. Um, being able to have some vibrant colors mixed with snow really helps me to create a winter scene that's not just stark and cold, but warm and inviting. So, you know, I think the message here is that every little corner of the park that you visit is going to offer different opportunities, not just in wildlife, but in landscape. And that brings me to some of the added drama that you get from frost and steam. Steam is present around all the geothermal features, um, but it can also extend into other areas of the landscape. So when the steam is thick and the wind is strong, we begin to see this naturally occurring condition enter into our scenes that really creates um, added drama. So this is up at Mammoth. But you know, when you get something like the steam and then the sun coming back in, the backlighting, the side lighting, anytime it captures the light, it becomes really compelling. These are conditions you really don't get anywhere else. And when the steam actually touches anything that might be exposed, like some of the grasses or the plants, it can develop um, ice crystals and hoarfrost in front of your eyes. And this creates really dramatic, intense, harsh, yet beautiful landscapes and winter scenes. And this is just a naturally occurring side effect of winter, um, but it is a texture. You know, look at all the texture in that frost right there. And that just popped up within an hour. And, you know, it provides us with something I talked about before. And that's that foreground element to our landscapes that is so crucial, I think, to, to really good landscape photography because it gives you a foreground, you have a middle ground, you have a background, and it creates a lot more dimension and texture, that thing you wanna reach out and touch. And that could be really hard to find in snowy conditions. So I like to place myself in places where I can anticipate that, that ice crystals may form or some of this frost that we're talking about because it just is another added layer and dimension in our imagery. So in that shot, is there a way to enhance the stream using a polarizer or something else? Actually, um, I did have a warming polarizer on this and I had a um, graduated neutral density filter. The, steam, the uh, stream was running really fast. I had considered remembering, considering putting my other filter on there instead, um, but I chose not to. And I was happy with the image I got more because the fact that the stream is there, it's present. It's almost like a leading line. It's not the main subject. A lot of times I will try and either layer a lot of compositional techniques, you know, foreground, leading lines, um, you know, all this stuff. But in this case with winter, I, I thought that the, you know, the frost, it was just so dramatic that particular year. This I think was two years ago. And I just really wanted to emphasize that. But I could have possibly smoothed out the water a little bit more. I did have a polarizer on it. Um, but again, I like the um, surreal look of all that white and everything going on. So a lot of this is personal preference. The questions that you're asking, yes. I mean, these are right answers that you're asking. Yes, I could have brought that stream out more. But you also have to decide for yourself, how do you want the image to look? You know, this is your artwork. Um, there is no right and wrong when it comes to art. There are tools that can help you make a decision on how to capture what you'd like to communicate. And that are, you know, tools like neutral density um, versus polarizers versus, you know, some of the other filters that we use. But again, decisions that we make as artists. And I guess, you know, my artistic style when it comes to winter Yellowstone is a little more dreamy than it is realistic. And that's just something that I feel when I'm out there because I, I do go through that stage of isolation and then I go into inner reflection 
of what I want to do and what I want to accomplish and how do I want to communicate what I'm seeing. So it all comes down to personal preference. Um, but I think having these tools in your bag and knowing how to use them opens up the possibilities of what you can do with your work. And to me, that is key. Understanding your gear, understanding what it can do and how you can work with it. It makes such a big difference because once you get through that understanding and you know how it works, you know composition and fundamentals of design, you're really just working on aesthetics. You're working on the fine art and the way you like to see things. And that's when photography becomes art. Um, yeah, so anyway, I do, that's a great question. And again, personal preference. Um, but you know, as wonderful as frost and steam can be for photography, it does really wreak havoc on your equipment. I mean, that moisture and the freezing temperatures can easily damage your gear if you are not comfortable or if you're not careful. Uh, so I do wanna talk a little bit about staying safe in freezing temperatures because this photo is very representative of the area around just about everything I have shown you. The trees are covered in snow. The trees are covered in ice. Um, I may be photographing the geysers and some of the other landscapes and the wildlife, but if you look in between all of that, you see nature trying to survive. Um, and if trees are having this hard of a time standing up straight and they've been, you know, weathered and bent over the years, but still hanging on to make it through the next season, what is it doing to us while we're out there for the day or possibly a week? I'd mentioned before, and this is extremely important, you never scrape ice off of your camera, your lens, your filters. Instead, you take your camera and lens into an interior, such as your vehicle or snow coach, and you allow that frost or ice to melt. And then you can gently wipe it off with a dry cloth. Um, pointing your lens upwards actually increases the chance of getting condensation on the lens. And once you have the condensation, the frost or ice can actually quickly develop. So I am always aware of the risk to my filters and my gear while I'm out there. And if I am photographing every couple of minutes, I am looking around to the front of my lens to see what's going on. That's very important. Um, you have snow and steam and ice and frost. It's all moving around in the air. So if you go to a scene and you photograph for 10 minutes and you get back and maybe your vehicle to warm up or something, and then you get back to your computer and everything's foggy and misty, you, it's because you didn't pay attention to the front of your lens and you really have to do that. I carry um, camping towels from REI. They have some really great camping towels that fold really small, but they're great for kind of wiping down things that might get a little bit too wet, especially a camera body and a huge supply of lens cloths during the winter months. Um, we talked about battery life. Someone asked that, uh, about that before. Um, battery life is extremely um, depleted by the cold temperatures and the colder, the worse it becomes. So prepare by having extra batteries on you. And especially if you have a mirrorless camera because those batteries aren't holding up as long as some of the DSLR cameras are, batteries are. So your battery life is shorter. I keep um, extra batteries in my pockets at all time, not in the backpack. I keep them in my pockets. So all my inner pockets next to my body are going to have batteries in them because that way my body heat on the inner layers is helping to keep it warm. They're not on the outer layers, they're on the inner layers. Now, how many batteries do you bring with you? And have you ever tried a lens warmer? I've heard about a lens warmer. Yeah, I have not tried one. Um, I'd be curious to try one, but I haven't tried one yet. And one of the concerns I have about a lens warmer is, is it going to cause any condensation to form between the camera and the lens? I just don't know. I haven't tried. I actually didn't even know they were out there until a couple of months ago. We were having a conversation in another webinar about those. I didn't get one. I didn't try it for this. Um, 
I carry for my wildlife camera, the 1DX Mark II, their camera battery life is exceptional. So I usually just have two in my pocket. As for the 5D Mark IV, those camera batteries tend to drain a bit faster. So I have four on me and one inside of the camera. And of course I charge them every night. I carry a couple of, of chargers um, so that I could get them charged up overnight. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Um, safety for you in winter is important, you know, but I think sometimes we forget that safety for the camera is every bit as important and, you know, it has a valuable life as well. I don't want anyone to go out in winter and do something like a Yellowstone adventure and get through day one and their gear isn't working. So you really have to treat everything extremely gently and with care so that it works for you throughout the entire trip. I'm going backwards again. <laughs> there we go. Well, just to close it up here, and then we'll get to some questions. But, you know, winter really can present some pretty spectacular scenery. And I think it's, you know, it's a couple of things that does that. And one, it's the low light in the sky. And in Yellowstone, it, it's usually the soft and muted clouds or the steam that helps to present and, and give you some atmosphere to your, to your landscape. And what makes Yellowstone so amazing is that you have so many different environments to explore. You have the geysers that shoot water up into the air and steam that runs through the trees. You have turquoise pools that are surrounded by pillows of snow. And then down the road, you can drive along the Madison River um, to a forest. And that presents a lot more opportunities for wildlife. So every corner of this park has something that's very different. Um, in the landscape. And that's wonderful for photographers because it gives us so many options. But um, my presentation's going a little wonky. <laughs> it's too, it quit. <laughs> I can hit play again and see what it does. There we go. But anyway, it's going to quit again. My computer says you were just wonky, but you know, I just, I want to finalize it with this one comment and this one photo, one of my favorite photos here. You know, sometimes in seclusion, as an artist, I can speak to this as an artist and a photographer, but sometimes in seclusion and in that silence, um, we find something different in ourselves that we carry to every other style of photography that we do. Um, but it's always with an understanding that winter has its very own story and that story in Yellowstone is survival. So thank you so much for listening to Winter in Yellowstone. And I'm, I'm hoping there are more questions I can answer for everybody. We have close to 50. I've been holding back. So <laughs> I'm going to go to the top here and just work, work my way through them. Um, uh -huh. Charles said he notices that you use a small aperture and a slow shutter speed. Why? Well, a lot of times if I'm using a slow shutter speed, it's because I want to say in the case of this particular photo, um, I would want to be able to get a little movement in the clouds. Or if it's water based and there's water around, then I want to be able to get the water to smooth out. I like still water. I'm not a fan of moving water. So I usually go for that silky effect. If it's a waterfall or if I'm in a coastal location, you know, I, I want to either completely remove it. Sometimes I'll put a 15 stop, um, on to completely remove any trace of water whatsoever and just get the reflection. But I like long exposures and I think that's why. It's not, Yellowstone in winter is not the best environment for it, but there are times it's very effective. If I want more of the clouds and the drama to come in or more of the steam to pass through my scene, I'm going to try and drag that shutter a little bit and extend my, my exposure time. And as far as, a, a, you know, using a, an exposure a lot, I use F22 a lot. The reason is, is so I can get more extended time on that. 
Um, I know a lot of people talk about diffraction when it comes to using F22. And I have to say, I just don't see it on my lenses. I've never seen it except maybe once. And I just, it doesn't bother me to have a little bit of distraction from an artistic standpoint. And if it's really bad, I guess, you know, that's something I would see in processing and I would either adjust it or obviously the photo wouldn't work. But um, I'm comfortable with it. Is it necessary all the time? Not for depth of field, but sometimes I just want to extend my time. It's a great question. Um, what time of year do you usually go to Yellowstone and what are the typical temperatures with wind chill? Okay, so I always go in January. I think that is the best time to go, though I have been in December, January, and February, but January seems to be the time of year where the animals still look really good. They haven't gotten into that extended month of February where they're starting to look a little run down and worn down, so the wildlife looks better. It would not make a difference for the landscape or the geothermal features. But that's why I like January. So I go there in January. That is my primary time for going. And what was the other question? Oh, I cleared it. <laughs> oh, hold on. Let me go back. The other one was, oh, they're out of order. I have lost it, but I'll try to find it. Um, the next question here, um, two of them, and I think they're related. Uh, what are your primary visual goals in Yellowstone in winter? And do you prepare each day to focus on landscape or wildlife so you can be more focused? That's really good. Actually, each day that I go out, I decide whether it's going to be wildlife or landscape. And I really try and focus my uh, time in that direction. But there are times when something, you know, you're working on a landscape and all of a sudden you see something, um, some type of wildlife come through and you're, you know, it's hard not to stop and photograph it. If, if it's something that I photograph a lot, then I might not be so interested. But, you know, if it's the wolf or, or moose or something like that, that's a little harder to see, then usually I'll turn my attention away, switch my cameras out. But no, I do go out with the intention of doing wildlife in certain areas of the park and with the intention of doing landscape in certain areas of the park. But I always have both cameras on the ready, especially for wildlife, because you just don't know when or where it'll appear. It's unpredictable. And that was the second question. I forgot the first one. Huh? <laughs> The last question from before was, what are the typical temperatures with wind chill? Well, I would say, you know, the last two years have been a little warmer than normal. Um, last week when I was there, I had a day that was almost 22. And I, I find that to be a little unusual, um, but it was a little warmer last year as well. But I will say, as far as averages go, in January, in the internal portion of the park where it's colder, um, I would say temperatures are maybe 15 to 20 as a high, and I would say maybe minus 5 to minus 10, though it is unpredictable and you have to prepare for extremes. The nice thing about being in the interior is if it does happen to go, you know, to 25 below and you're too uncomfortable, you have a snow coach and you can get in there until you feel comfortable. So, but you always got to prepare for the extremes. I actually, I have a lot here. I take two pair of boots. Um, I take snow pants. I take rain pants. Cause if you do have a warm day, um, it, there's no sense in overheating, but that's pretty rare. I think I've only used those ones. <laughs> have you shot the Firehole River? I have. I have. That's a beautiful location. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've done it in the winter. I think I've gone back there maybe once in the winter, but I've gone back there during other seasons. Even in a snow coach, that road tends to frighten me a little bit, but it is a lovely, lovely area. Very secluded off the beaten track a little bit and very nice. On some of your first shots, you used 400 ISO, ISO and Mark mm -hmm. wanted to know why you chose 400. Is it a wildlife or a landscape? Probably it could have been because of how dark it was outside you know if I'm not if I didn't have any water in the photograph to be concerned about and I wasn't trying to get a long exposure um but I wanted to photograph and you know I'm I have no problem with ISO 400. I don't get any noise problems with 400. So if it is darker, you know, take this 
shot here that I have up at the moment is obviously a little darker than some of the other scenes. The light is not as strong or powerful. And if that's the case, I'll often just bump my ISO up. And there's also times that I'm working on, say, a wildlife um, outing and I see something that looks beautiful in landscape and I put it on, you know, a different tripod, the camera on a different tripod or something, and I, I'd quickly take a shot and I forget that I didn't change my ISO. So that happens too. No, always accidents. We did have a few people ask if, if they can review this information somehow. And yes, everyone who registered will get a link to watch the recorded session tonight. It'll take some time to process, but you'll get that tonight. Um, and then uh, someone asked, how do you decide on the correct exposure? Do you do it by the histogram? Always. In the winter, I think it's essential to do that. Um, a lot of times with all the white reflecting in from all around you, it's very hard to see the viewfinder, even if you have a loop. Um, so I, I can't rely on that. And again, I cannot rely on the camera's metering system to read the white correctly. It's going to read it at about 18% gray. So knowing that for winter in any location that you go to, if it's a snowy condition, you really have to look at the histogram. And I pay attention to my histogram all the time, but it is so much more important in a stark white winter environment because you have to make sure that your whites aren't too gray. Um, so again, I move those whites up. That histogram is my tool. That's what I depend on. And Jane wants to know, when is your next group trip to Yellowstone? Oh, next year, 20, 2022. I think we have two back to back. Um, we had one this year, unfortunately, the snow lodge closed due to COVID and some of those workers are furloughed, but we have our dates in for, I think, two weeks of reservation. So we're either going to two, two, maybe three if possible, back to back to make up for it. So we do have a, uh, a waiting list. So you're welcome to send an email. And as soon as they get back in, I think they said April or May, they would confirm the dates and get everything arranged. We'll let people know. And we have a bunch of snow coach questions. Are you able to get out of the snow coach and walk to find places to shoot? Does it just drop you off and come back for you later? It doesn't necessarily drop you off and come back. It drops you, it allows you to get out of the snow coach, but it will wait. <laughs> um, I think if they turned around and went down the road and went off the road or something like that, you know, you'd be stranded out there. So I imagine there are some regulations that don't allow them to drop you off and come back, but they're very patient. And, and remember, there's not much traffic on the road. So it's easy for them to pull over in certain areas and say, okay, you know, I'll sit here until you're done photographing. And that's why places like some of those trees along the uh, west side of the park that I photograph a lot, it's a really nice small area maybe a half a mile walk at most and you know so they'll park down the road you get out you walk you explore you're photographing all this stuff and then you know you get back to the snow coach so yes they do let you out I think you know a lot of that's going to depend on how you communicate with the snow coach driver and what kind of group you're going with so my charters are private charters and so I get to tell them what I want. If you were going with a general um, Yellowstone tour, I would be sure to ask questions like, when can you stop? How often can you get out? Because a lot of the generalized tours are not for just photographers, they're for people who are visiting, even if it's just for the day. They may have driven down, driven down on a snow coach or maybe have one night in the park and you know they wanna get out and see some stuff and it may just be a drive around tour. So I think asking those questions when you set up the um, snow coach um, tour that it's important to know, ask those questions because it's going to vary. And are the snow coach drivers trained as guides generally? They're trained as snow coach drivers, but they do know the park very well, some better than others. Um, there are a lot of people that have been doing this for years within the park and some that know where the wildlife are and you know specific sightings, I mean. And when I say specific sightings, it's for the unusual things, you know, because you're going to see bison and coyote and other things. But when you're looking for red fox or for wolves, they they do get some insider tips, I think, at times. So I'm, I'm always asking. I ask every driver I see in the uh, hotel parking lot whether I know them or not. <laughs> I wanted to know everything. And I do a lot of research on my own before I go. And I, and I speak with friends and colleagues as to what they've seen in the last day or so. 
and, and I read reports because I want to make sure that I'm on top of it as well. I don't want to rely on just one person to know where, where to go. But also from experience, I know that certain areas of the park are more prone to get certain conditions that I want to photograph. So someone in our audience used a snow coach a couple of years ago they weren't happy with, and they're wondering if you have a suggestion for a snow coach company. Um, if you weren't happy with the snow coach company, I guess my first question would be, was it something that was inside the park? I mean, did it originate um, by Zantera, who does the park lodging and, and some of these um, snow coach rentals? Or was it a company in Gardner that took you into the park or West Yellowstone that took you into the park? Um, that would be my first question. Per day for a snow coach and a driver. I'm sorry. What what does it cost per day for the snow coach? Uh, um, for a private snow coach, in you know before next year's season, which I have no idea what that's going to be at this point, but I would say it's usually about two thousand to twenty two hundred dollars for a private snow coach, um, and then there's a gratuity that would be expected for your driver and guide. So it is expensive. So if you get in a group tour, obviously that's less expensive for you. And that's just a day, that's eight hours. So if you're a photographer and you wanna be out for 12 hours, you have to pay additional fees to extend that. So the interior of Yellowstone, it's, it is expensive, but I would say it's worth it, at least for a once in a lifetime trip, just that experience. You can experience some of it by staying in Gardner, or West Yellowstone and getting partly into the park. Um, but you don't get to get everywhere. You don't get to all the magical spots. So I, I think for me, just because I've gone through and experienced that, I want to share that with other people. And that's the way I set up my groups so that we get to all those locations. And then, you know, I ran into someone I knew that had taken a Yellowstone workshop with me um, a couple of years ago. And she was out there photographing in Lamar Valley by herself or with a couple of friends. And it was like, oh, that's cool. Well, good to see you, you know, but she already did the big trip. She did all the magical spots and then she was just there for wildlife. So I think, it, you know, obviously everybody has a budget and, you know, I do this professionally for a living. So, you know, my budget sometimes is a little higher, um, but for, I mean, higher for photography, but I think you could get good services. I would re read TripAdvisor if you're not going inside the park to do it. Definitely check out TripAdvisor to see who you like and who you don't like from Gardner or West Yellowstone. I don't use those services. I did in West Yellowstone for a year. I was not happy personally by my, you know, myself. It takes nearly two hours to get anywhere, even into the park area um, by snow coach. So if you're positioned outside of the park, it, you're really missing a lot of good stuff. And how many days do you spend on a trip? Do you plan to go to different locations each day? Mm -hmm. I do. So I pick a different area of the park each day. So usually we'll do Lamar Valley for one and a half days, maybe two days. And we'll stay up at the Mammoth Hotel for that. The rest of it, um, I have about four nights down at Old Faithful Snow Lodge. And um, from there, we can get down to the West Lake. We can get into Hayden Valley. We can get to the geothermal features. And we, we just spend a lot of time there and usually have an extra day. So if we know the wolves are here, we're going to go here. There are waterfalls down there. Um, you can access just about everything. And I would, I would have to say it's very hard to even get Yellowstone in winter done in six days and actually see everything. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do. There's a lot to that park um, and there, you know, so many opportunities, but I wouldn't go for any less than six days. And a lot of your photos use a three-stop ND filter. Is that usual for the bright conditions of the snow? Um, it depends on the sky, you know, how bright is the sky? So if the sky is super bright, then I go to the four stop. And, it, you know, if it's super, super bright, like some of the dark, really dark black and white um, images that are in my portfolio, sometimes I'll stack the three in the four to get that much of a stop. But that's an artistic approach more than a necessity approach. But I find that the three and the four um, are really good tools. It, but again, it, it depends on the light. If there's sunlight hitting the background, if, if we're seeing sky, you know, that's all going to make a difference. If we're not seeing that much and it's mainly just foreground, then, you know, I, 
the the amount of stops that I need to tone down that background are going to be, you know, minimal. Three stop would do the trick. I will say personally, I know there are two stops and one stops out there, but I mean the two, the three and the four are just worth it. It's just it's all I carry. I've gone through, I've had one and two stops, but I don't think they do enough in most conditions, which is why I, I have the three and the fours. And then you said that you prefer the soft stop, but can you talk about when to use the soft versus the hard stop filters? Sure. Yeah. I mean, again, it's a personal preference. So I like that smoother transition um, because again, I'm not always photographing something with a hard edge, but say you go to the coast or something, you know, where you do have a hard edge or you have a very flat horizon line. There are places where that's very prominent throughout the country. Um, you know, you get areas in the badlands where you have rock formations, valley of fire, um, that you have this very straight, perfect horizon line. Well, a dark darker one there could work really well. They work really well at the coast. Um, I also use the reverse grads at the coast a lot because you do have that flat horizon line. And I think that's when the, the darker ones, um, you know, the, the non-soft, the hard stop I'm trying to say, actually work really well. <laughs> and are there some usual filters that never leave your pouch? Yes. I have um, a neutral polarizer. I have the warming polarizer. I have the UV warming protector. I have the three stop. I have the four stop graduated. I have a 15 stop neutral. That one actually doesn't go everywhere with me. Um, I have, but I do have the very, very and duo filters and I have filters in both 77 and 82 to fit all my lens. So I have a separate pouch for each one of those. And then I have a pouch for the uh, rectangle filters that I have. Those are standard. I don't go anywhere without them. Do you use various film simulations? various film simulations. Yeah, so we had a speaker, he likes to he likes to say he uses this particular roll of film, but it's like a set of settings in his camera that's set to a, huh. like a roll of film. So. so more of an artistic approach to the processing. Um, you know, I, I really don't. Um, if I'm going to do anything from an artistic you know, perspective, it's probably going to be in the processing stage. Like I do this summer, I got topaz because I was photographing some, some macro. I, I got a lens baby and sitting on my porch day after day, <laughs> like, what am I going to do? got to try something different. So I entertained um, some filters and some artistic processing techniques with that. Um, again, but that's just something that I was trying on my own for the summer. It's probably not something I would do except for once in a while when I was in the mood. Um, you know, there are a lot of settings inside the camera that you can do. You can photograph in black and white. Um, I always photograph in raw though, because I, you know, I photograph raw. And so ultimately anything that comes into my processing is going to be that raw file anyway. So I think a lot of these settings and some of the cameras that you get to will convert your image to a JPEG. And for me, since I print my images at a very large size, um, that doesn't really work well for me, but it can help you to see how you may want to process the raw file that it also takes um for when you get to the computer so that you can create some really interesting artwork you know i i say i'm a photo artist um i do like realism in my photo artistry but i also you know like the ability to express it in my own style so everybody should follow and search their own style and try different things that's how we grow sure. will in-camera metering work when you have a polarizer and a graduated filter on um, it can work, um, you know, I do because I'm photographing in manual um, when I'm photographing anything like that. I wouldn't use that setup necessarily for wildlife, um, but, you know, in my camera system, it works, and, but I do have to change my exposure or if I want to keep it underexposed, like in the case of some of those storms, then I go ahead and take the photo. I check the histogram. Um, and I want to make sure that my histogram is correct. So yes, I believe at least in my system, it works just fine, but that doesn't mean I'm going to use what the camera is recommending from an artistic standpoint. 
And if you could pull up an image that is silhouette-like, uh, Paul wanted to know, does the warming, what does the warming filter add in the silhouette-like shots? Does it differentiate the cool snow from the warm sky? I think so. Uh, like in this case here, this is all snow. Um, but, you know, the animal is warm. Snow can be warm. Snow can be cold, you know, cold. If, if there's sky reflecting, actually snow is oftentimes very blue, just naturally blue. And I kind of like it to be a little bit more white. And I like to bring out the warm tones in wildlife that is naturally warm. So that's why I will use uh, a warming filter, but let's get, I should have had a warming filter on this one. I actually didn't, it came across this so fast. I had to move quickly, but let me see if I can get to something else that we might be talking about here. Well, like here, um, what did I have on here? I did have the warming polarizer on this one. And this is a color photo. This is not converted to black and white. And I used the four stop GND filter on there, the soft one. Um, but it would allow me to bring down a lot of the texture up here in the sky, which, you know, there's a lot of drama going on there. Um, but it also cast a little bit of a warmth to it, especially noticeable up in here. It's interesting to me that Yellowstone in winter um, and other locations in winter can often appear so black and white when they're really not. But adding a little bit of that color cast to me um, is a decision that I make when I look at the situation that I'm photographing. You know, do I want a sense of warmth? Do I want a sense of cool? And then sometimes I come back and, you know, I think, well, you know, it's going to look better in black and white or more powerful. So it, it, again, it's always a personal decision. Um, no right and wrong, but I think it's important that you try both. And then this is a good picture to be on for the next question. While shooting landscape, I noticed sometimes you choose F22, sometimes F11, why? It probably depends on the lens that I'm using. So in this case, I'm on the one to 400 lens. Um, so this is what I would call an intimate landscape. And I, because everything is at infinity, I'm going to use the sharpest point of, of my f-stop range, which in this for this camera is f11. I don't have to worry about wildlife being up close. I don't necessarily need to worry about speed. Um, I just need to worry about, you know, the composition and the artistic look that I'm trying to get. So that's why I would use F11. But say we got to something like this. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, I was shooting lower to the ground. See, this is an F22, but I'm very low to the ground here. I'm, I'm probably got my tripod extended, um, closed up to the bottom leg and I'm kneeling in the snow because I really wanted to exaggerate some of the texture that you see in here. You see the, let me see if I get my mouse over there. Um, you see some of the texture in the snow and the ripples, a little bit of frost on top of the snow. I'm really low to the ground. So I need to make sure that that's in focus the streams in focus and all these trees going off here into the distance, which appear to be close, but because I'm low to the ground, they're really not. It's, it's a little bit visually misleading, but if I didn't have an F22 here, my trees may not be sharp. I was really close to the foreground. And so anytime I fo photograph a foreground element, whether it be this snow or a rock or anything else, my lens can be like four inches away from that because I really want to exaggerate whether it's the detail, the texture, um, the color, whatever that might be. So I'm very, very close. That hyperfocal distance comes into play. My focal point is not right here, you know, it's back in here somewhere, probably about right in here. I would have put my focal point and I would have photographed so that everything was in focus. So that's for me, the difference between F11 and F22 has to do with the lens that I'm using and the distance of the subject to the lens in the background. Do you ever use your iPhone as a third camera? Sometimes <laughs> it comes in handy. <laughs> I've gotten some really good iPhone photos. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I am not an iPhone master photographer by any means, but you know, when you're standing there sometimes and you're photographing, you know, some stuff or you're waiting or you want to be able to share something quickly with family and friends. Absolutely. 
I mean, the iPhones have a really good camera system in there. Um, what brand of tripod do you have? What model? I have um, two models of the really right stuff. One is just a little older than the other, but I think they're both the, the TV 32s, I believe they are. And one of them is the extra long. So the first one I got was the regular lens and or the regular size. And I'm not that tall. I'm about five, three, I guess. And I really enjoyed that first one, but by the time I got out to some locations where I'm photographing on a hillside or I need my camera to be raised, I realized I didn't have that extra length. So the second tripod I got was the extra long extended, which stands much taller than I am. Um, and it's very hard to actually see the back of the LCD screen sometimes, <laughs> unless I have something to step up on. Um, and sometimes I just kind of shoot and go with that one. But, you know, I have tripods for different sizes, but really right or with different heights, but really right stuff to me. Um, I've been really happy with them. I had good so before that I was happy with that. And I do have a good so 500 series that I haven't used in years. It's just too big and heavy. But um, I think we all go through the range of different tripods as we get further and further into photography. So of course my first tripod was $20. And then, you know, there was like, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. And someone said, get so. So I went and bought the get so after the $20 tripod and I bought it used. It didn't, it lasted a while and finally gave out. I was very hard on my tripods. I take better care of them now. And I've had my really right stuff, one of them for probably seven years and the other one, maybe three years. I love them both. They're fantastic. Um, and a couple of people asked about waterfalls. We didn't have any waterfall shots, but do you shoot the waterfalls too? do you know in winter they're typically frozen and sometimes a little bit harder to get to so for Yellowstone waterfalls they're a little more rare I, I can get some waterways I can get down Firehole Canyon I can uh, get behind on that back road there and and do some of the boulders that are in the water and there is another waterfall that is south south of um, Old Faithful that I have been to and photographed, but they photograph, I think, a little bit differently. In winter, they're, they're frozen. Most of them are frozen. And while I like that, um, I think I prefer some of the other stuff better. But that's just Yellowstone speaking, you know, directly. I photograph waterfalls all the time. I live um, over here by the Smoky Mountains. So when springtime comes around, I mean, I, I could drive down the road and count 100 waterfalls after a rain and always photographing the waterfalls here. We have tons of them here in the Carolinas. So big fan of waterfalls, absolutely. <laughs> and you talked about extenders being sharp. Um, this person said they've tried and didn't have much success. What size mm -hmm. extenders do you use? I, I had the same issue and I've heard the same complaint. So the first extender that I got was a two, you know, a 2.0 extender. And I don't think I ever really got it tack sharp in the field. So I tested that with some friends. You know, I know a lot of photographers. I, I, I was a director of photography and creative director before I started doing this. So I, I had a very large network of professional photographers. And so I, I had them tested in studio under control under controlled conditions and the and the two work just fine but I really felt like I never got anything as sharp as I wanted it to so I went to the 1.4 and it works fantastic there's no question whatsoever about the quality of the 1.4 I've heard other people say they have problems you know and some of it I guess in my case if the studio guy got it to work the studio photographer there's it's not the it's not the extender, it's user error, but I cannot figure out how to get a, a good shot with that 1.4 extender, no problem at all. Okay, we're getting down to the last of the questions here. Mm -hmm. Paul wants to know, do you enter Lamar Valley from the Montana side where your car is allowed or from West Yellowstone in a snow cap? Well, I have entered West Yellowstone in the snow coach. It has been a few years since I've done that. Um, if I go into the park, I fly into Bozeman, 
And if it's with a group, we get um, someone to shuttle us down to Mammoth. And then from there, the park picks us up at Mammoth. If I'm going into Lamar Valley by myself, like last week, I would fly into Bozeman. Um, it's an all day event. So I usually stay in Gardner the first night and then, you know, pack all my gear ready to go out and photograph. And I drive over and stay in Cook City. Um, Cook City is, it, there's not much there. There's a couple of hotels, the food, <laughs> pack some cheese and crackers and some soup and maybe some oatmeal I think that's how I survive over there um, there's not a lot there but the positioning to Lamar Valley is really fantastic so if you're going specifically for wildlife like my last week's trip was it was really just wildlife based um, I positioned myself in Cook City and that's where I went yeah, um, West Yellowstone's fine. I just want to get into the park and the park doesn't pick you up. Like our snow cats or snow coaches in the park that I hire, they're not going to get me in West Yellowstone. Everyone coming from West Yellowstone on a snow coach is an independent um, company based out of West Yellowstone. Um, let's see. How many people do you take in your group? Um, a 13 person snow coach i'm an instructor and i will take six or seven um, on each adventure we keep it really small if we get enough people we'll get two snow coaches and I, I think you know that's something that we may do because we have so many people on this this you know for next year because we miss so many not only are we doing two back to back but i think we have about 200 people ready to go mm -hmm. and um you know i know yellowstone very well so yeah. And I have become a winter photographer, so I'm really happy to get in there and, and get some people some really wonderful photos. And I miss it. I've been gone a week and I miss it. <laughs> How close do you come to animals in the park in the winter? Yeah, you know, it depends. Um, you know, for instance, uh, there were, the fox that I was photographing was quite a distance off, the red fox. Um, but I waited until everyone left. You couldn't even get in. It seemed like every it was the only thing to photograph that day in the park. And so I waited and everybody kind of cleared out. I was staying in Cook City. I knew I had time. And he eventually came closer to the road. So maybe 100, 200 feet away or something like that. So I was able to get some nice photos with him. Um, a lot of the animals are dangerous and I do my best to stay quite a distance away. But, you know, sometimes they're close to the road. The uh, kill site with the uh, elk and the three coyotes on it. There were actually four coyotes, um, but that the fourth one had walked out of the scene when I took that photo. Um, I, you know, it was just 300, 300 feet off the road. I mean, so it's pretty easy to stop and, and park somewhere and hike up to wherever it happens to be. You can't just park on the road anywhere. You have to find a pool out. Um, but a lot of times they're quite, you know, they're out in the valley. So it depends. They, they could be half a mile away. They could be, you know, pretty close. I try not to get too close to wildlife. I know it's not good for them. And so that's what a long lens is for. And I rely on that. And yes, sometimes I have to crop the image too. But uh you know, it's again a safety factor. So I try not to get too close to them. Do you ever use crop mode to get more zooming or only full frame and then crop in post? The cameras I have are full frame and do not have crop mode. But if you have crop mode, I think that's fantastic. Um, I actually, I do have 7D Mark II. Um, but I didn't care for it as much as I cared, which is a wildlife camera. It is a crop sensor. I didn't care for it as much as far as the, the shots per second that I can get, which I think is important for wildlife when they're moving. So um, I don't carry that one anymore. But if you have crop sensor in there, go for it. Absolutely. That increases it later. But for me, I have to rely on, on framing when I get back to the computer. Mm -hmm. Do you customize your camera's picture detail as an example, increasing sharpness, saturation, et cetera? Not in camera. So anything that I do is in processing. So when I get to, I use Lightroom primarily and I do use Photoshop. My Photoshop is used really, I'll use Photoshop more for black and white because I'm doing a lot of dodging and burning. But um, for most of my work, when I'm using Photoshop, it is for distortion correction and landscape, and it's for cleanup because I think their tools are superior 
um, you know, you have so many options. I think there are four or five different tools that you can remove your dust dot spots, your snow spots. You know, winter, it has snow. You're going to have to constantly check your lens. And sometimes, you know, if even in a split second, you can get a drop of snow, a snowflake or something on there or dust or something you need to get that cleaned up. I do that in Photoshop, but for Lightroom, I developed a preset that I like so that every image that I import has some color correction already applied to it. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I, I always, you know, refer to the film days. You used to choose your film based on the outcome that you wanted to get. When we are looking at the back of our camera, we're seeing a JPEG, our camera is a process. They're so much more colorful than the raw file. So for me to import all the images, I want to have a little bit of that color applied. So I, I have a little bit, you know, it's 25% contrast, 15% vi uh, vibrance, 5% saturation. And then I just have my, you know, two lens correction boxes ticked there. Um, and I create a preset for that. So every photo that comes in already has that. Doesn't mean I won't adjust it um, as I process an image necessarily, but it does help me with the initial process of culling my image images because there's already some color added to it um, and I don't want to say added necessarily it is added but it's just reintroduced to what you saw both with your eye through the lens and on the back of your camera and then Gary said that Olympus cameras are best in bad conditions have you tried them um, which cameras do you think can be put through the worst conditions Those are excellent questions. I've heard really good things about Olympus. Um, I know one of the Olympus um, ambassadors and he came to one of my workshops and I think, you know, he, he really liked it. I liked it as well, but I've been Canon my whole life. I, I just don't see myself changing. Um, as far as cameras, each one of them is dependent. So for instance, my both my five and my one, these are rated for extreme conditions. They're completely weatherproofed. Now, that doesn't mean moisture is not going to get in there and I'm not going to have a day where it's just not going to cooperate or work. But I always choose my gear with the intention that I'm going to be in the harshest of outdoor elements, rain, snow, ice, cold, um, sand, salt. And I just want to make sure that everything is rated for those conditions. So that's why I choose everything, that uh, including my tripod. That leads into another one. Barbara wanted to know how much luggage you bring. She said she thinks she'd have three huge bags with all the clothes, boots, outerwear, camera gear, et cetera. She's really curious what it looks like. <laughs> well, it's surprising, actually. So I have a backpack. I have a rolling think tank. I have two different sizes. So it depends. You know, I've got the regional size. Um, which is smaller and I have the standard size that can go on any flight as well. Um, and then I have one suitcase. So I am a master packer, <laughs> like insanely goofy, crazy packing. Um, but, you know, again, I have, especially for winter, yes, I have snow pants, I have rain pants. The snow pants are bulky. I have... While I used to wear a winter jacket, I actually do not wear a big winter down jacket in, in most cases, unless I can research the conditions the weather's are going to be bad, the weather's gonna be really cold. I have a parka that I take that is um, an Arctic, Ar Arcteryx <laughs> parka. And I have a nano puff that goes underneath that. And then I have a Patagonia um, zip up that goes underneath that and then I have a fleece and then I have a thermal so I have a, a lot of really small layers and that allows me to you know kind of open up the zippers if I get a little too warm so um, it actually packs really small and then under the snow pants I, I wear you know fleece long underwear or you know thinner ones in case you know it's a little too warm but I can pack it all in one bag and one medium sized bag I have to take the feet off my tripod, but both of them, but I can do it. <laughs> um, and then what type of vehicle would you use to go on Cook City Road? I get, um, you know, that's a good question. In the winter time, I get something that's four wheel drive. So I go with the SUV, um, the full size SUV because they always have four wheel drive. 
I will say that a lot of people travel that road that live around there up in Bozeman and surrounding areas. They come in and just, you know, small SUVs or regular cars and they do just fine. I think for me, um, I, I know how to drive in winter. I'm comfortable with it now. I've been doing it a long time, but it, it feels better to have that four wheel drive. <laughs> just for me personally, um, and especially because, you know, I might be out there by myself. So I wanna make sure that I, if I go off the road a little bit, I can get myself back out. So I'm more comfortable that way. Awesome, well, believe it or not. We I don't wanna have to worry about anything except photography. <laughs> <laughs> so we've made it through all of the questions. Um, I wanted to thank you so much for your time and all of the comments, I'll send them to you so you can see. Um, we've had a lot of really appreciative audience members and um, a virtual standing ovation, I think, happening in the chat window. So that's been great. And the questions have been awesome. Oh, thank you. If anyone wants to join us again next month, Singray does these once a month and you can find them online at singray.com slash webinars. Um, and you'll see the next ones listed there. We're working on more details for that. Um, but everyone, thank you so much for being here. This has been great. Thanks everyone.